Recording is on. Good morning, everybody. It's November the 28th, Sunday, and the Eastern Extinction RT meeting. So let's get the show on the road with um, a little agenda I put together. Hi, Petra. <laughs> um, so, yeah, has anybody got stuff they want to talk about today? Because well, the things that I put down was about the sigil, about doing the um, Extinction RT manifesto, and uh, one other thing. Oh, uh, yeah, about the... The bug, the bug. I just wanted to say something about the bug. Because me a little nervous. I just wanted to share my feelings, my instincts about the bug. Maybe we should do that first. Does anybody want to talk about anything else or does anybody not want to talk about that? Oh, Ned, no. uh, it sounds like uh, you want to, you've got a few things in mind. Maybe we'll talk about that first. <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, I, uh, you know, all along I uh, just had this, uh, something just not that right with this, with this, this uh, situation, which you know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, and this, okay, so, uh, and it just like kind of got to the point where I just had to voice it because this thing, uh, the G variant um, from South Africa is just, it's just not right. I mean, the the what I mean in particular is the 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 who on Friday they they didn't ban flights or travel or stuff from from South Africa. It's just it's just unthinkable. I just can't. There's no excuse. I mean, there was an excuse for for Wuhan and and being slow to ban travel. You can always say, oh, you know, they don't because G has infiltrated the who terribly. And, you know, you, you can say economic reasons, but there is no reason from a, you know, what Trump would call a shithole country from from Africa. It's like, you, I mean, they've done it all the time with Ebola, anything else. They, they stop the flight as soon as they know the problem. The, the African governments try and hide, hide uh, you know, the previous um, problems um, with things like Ebola. But they, you know, I just, I just... I just can't shake this feeling from my spidey senses that this, this just things are just, they, they just don't add up. They just, I'm, I'm just so damn suspicious. Um, I mean, I, I can't see why these guys would go to such a lot of trouble to try and force, you know, these jabs when they know they don't work. <laughs> they know that it's not stopping the spread. It's not doing anything. And yet, they almost get to the point of civil war to try and make people have it. And then, you know, this um, this new variant, it looks scary. And then, you know, they just do nothing. And it's like, what? It's, I mean, it's just, I don't know. I, what do people think about it? Well, I mean, it's at the stage where you tend to think everything about it. Uh, you know, um, that the line of thought can go off in so many different directions. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I've been thinking about it. Yesterday I had a, a surprise meeting with loads of people uh, from around here, from the community who are, um, who don't want to get vaccinated. <laughs> and they had a- Don't yeah. use the B words, don't use the B words. Yeah, yeah. Well, we had we had a secret kind of meeting in a in a venue, and uh, they don't. They, it's some of them are actually, but they just uh, got this. And we we were talking about that yesterday too. And like, it's it, it as you say, doesn't add up. The timing, the the flights, um, the type of 
of uh, of Borg and uh, I've I've read a few things on it and then I was waiting for that meeting yesterday I had the time to check what Mr Kevin was saying and I put on his last stream and of course it's it's nearly impossible to listen to it because he's all scattered it's going all over the place you know uh, but he so it's it's mixed with all his rants about about everything basically he's just he's just going i think he's i think it's it's very he's very confusing um to listen to so i don't know is he confused in his in his brain too i don't know um but i i was wondering should we not um i don't know uh shall we have another little chat with him or even non-recorded you know just to see yeah. a, bit, a bit of information yeah. because i think it's the the information on the nature of these bugs is is comp doesn't add up yeah. either. It's a different. I mean, yeah. I, I I understand very little about genomes and and some stuff like that. The the basic that I had in my medical training. I'm not a I'm not a specialist in. And I try I've tried to read some articles like that, and I've seen. But that looks a bit. That 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 one looks a little bit bizarre. And they're announcing already that they kind that it's not going to. Um, but the vac, the 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 jab is not going to cover for that. I, it's yeah. There's I I don't know. Oh. There's too many questions. Yeah, I mean I'm I'm I don't know anything about virology, but the um I I just know how to read bullshit, <laughs> and so I have a good bullshit detector, and uh, especially when it comes to expert bullshitters, I, I'm very good at ferreting them out. So, but uh, yeah, um. Yeah, the, um, I posted something which I think was, I think, what, what what I expect, not being a virologist, is that it's a chimera. It's something that I was kind of worried about for a long time, and that's that it's a chimera. So that it, the, you know the virus at some stage is going to cause the, you know, go chimeric sometime because it mutates like crazy, and so then, you know, RNA things like, like HIV are very good candidates for, you know, especially in Africa. Africa is riddled with HIV. And so, you know, I think um, that's a bit of a nightmare, I think. I mean, I can't think, yeah, you know, if you have 23, was, what was it, 23 variations? That's too much for a uh, single... 32. 32, yeah. Uh, that's too mm. much for single nuclear, nucleotide polymorphisms. That's just, you know, like one, you know, coding error at a time. That's like 32... Coding errors is just not not the old ones, just like yeah. yeah. So and and the best possible, I mean, the most obvious hybrid is HIV because you know HIV people are immunocompromised, so they likely to get it. I don't believe the statistics coming out of Africa. They go, oh, Africa, <laughs> come on, <laughs> you just don't know Africa. Africa has got to be riddled with it. Uh, there's no way it's a, Africa with dense populations and. And travel, and you know the, that it's you know, the, and, and also there's a lot of statistics that it goes for for black people more. Well, so, I agree. I agree with what you're saying on the fact that it's probably not generating from there, but I'm also remembering early in the in the pre uh, jab campaign that there was this guy, this Flemish guy, uh, Gert something, who was talking Fan about the danger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The dangers yeah. of of, uh, of a campaign in the middle of a, an epidemic, which would increase the possibility of, of uh, mutations, which is that makes total sense. It's just, you know, it's it's just we all know that before. And I, I know those uh, those products are a little bit different from traditional um, uh, jabs, but still, I think I think he he made a point that stayed with me, and I think that is a very now I've looked at the at the the rate of of that. Of, <laughs> of jabs in in uh, in Africa compared to other parts of the world, and it's it's there's much more it's much more likely that uh, the emergence of a mutation would happen in another part where where there would be an awful lot of people who had been been jabbed, and uh, and South Africa is the is one of the countries where it's well it's actually higher it's the highest in Africa it's not very high but it's highest in Africa because the general rate in Africa is about six percent and I think in South Africa it's about 25 or 30 so it's it's just um I, I anyway that that guy that uh, that the few talks he made and were made a lot of sense and were very accessible 
to the general public. They were not too difficult to understand. And uh, yeah, I, I think that's what we're seeing. I think we're seeing this, uh, the effect of, of, of this campaign now. We're going to see a, a little, oh, a little, a little cove, a uh, little friend who's going to try to, 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 to create. I don't know. You, you're seeing a chimera, but yeah, but that's no, naturally yeah, think, occurring. You mean, you mean a naturally? Yeah, no, I, think, I think Africa's only like two or three percent. Um, yeah, in Jack, general, so but there are some that... places. There's some places that have got more. Um, some, some places, some cities. And, uh, and particularly South Africa. Oh, Africa is very low. I think it's six percent, but I'm not sure. I could double check yeah, that. But, but there are some pockets. Well, I, I wouldn't think. I wouldn't think it's the uh, uh, the the V word driving it. Uh, I wouldn't think it was that because the, um, I just you know I think that's probably something that happens in the Western world and stuff. So I uh, yeah <clears throat> no I. Um, and also, it couldn't, uh, you know, I think it would be driven slowly by a variant at a time. Not, not, you know, 32 um, novelties is, is too much. It's, uh, to me, it's, it must be a variant. I mean, it must be a, a genera, it must be a hybrid of, of a couple of them. But um, the, so the, the thing I'll tell you, I mean, I'm, I'm not against. Uh, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I'm not against vaccinations per se. I mean, I were, my kids all got the measles, mumps, and rubella stuff, and it's it's this 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 is <laughs> it's something different. It's not um, oh you know something that might give you autism or something. This is, so I'll, I'll tell you one one other you know under special circumstances I I, I wouldn't recommend taking <laughs> these things uh, with the caveat that yeah you know. You might have to face the actual disease, and then you you might be sorry you listen to me. But I'll tell you where my prejudices are coming from, and that's because it's um, South Africa. So if you just Google Project Coast, and it's like uh, that's that's where it all comes from. I, mean, it's, uh, I I you know I'm sure about enough about the stuff that I mentioned it in a few videos. But if you mention anything about the origins of HIV, as uh, automatic dismissal, laughed out the room, conspiracy theory. But I, I, I want to share what, you know, my feelings to you, because when I was in the Air Force, the, the, the bar talk was that um, HIV was, uh, AIDS was uh, developed in, by South Africa in a lab and, you know, distributed in, Kins in Kinshasa. Now, that um, <clears throat> Project Coast, uh, I think a lot of people knew. I think everybody knew, but Project Coast basically it's called Project Coast because they they put uh, you know basically their test subjects in um, you know basically the bodies in the back of C-130s Hercules, and I think they flew from like Pretoria to uh, Esterplatte and then out to the Southern Ocean. Uh, C-130s got a big ramp at the back. They put the ramp down and then roll all the bodies out and they'll be is in more than but the the bodies that they rolled up they, they were not their failures they, they were their successes so um a lot of people you know man, we're talking about 200 people from Mavombo and stuff you know the, the um a lot of uh, guys when I, and it all came out after um you know this guy voter basson and others um uh, it all came out after the end of apartheid um so it's been established as fact that South Africa was promoting AIDS and deliberately trying to spread it. Uh, it's it, South Africa's population would be much bigger today, maybe double if it wasn't for AIDS. So, the um, it, it, so yeah, I mean, uh, the the eugenicists out there. The uh, the worrying thing is that Voter Besson didn't didn't do it alone. He got help um, from all over the place, from particularly from Israel. It, South Africa built the the bomb with Israel. So Israel and South Africa is a joint venture between, a bomb is a joint venture between Israel and South Africa. And the exchange was South Africa gave the enriched uranium and um, Israel gave the technology. Um, I, I know all this um, because of, I mean, it's come out in the public, but I knew all this because my, my parents worked at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. And so they, I met some of the guys doing this. Um, when I was a kid, um, and you could, you knew what they were doing. <laughs> they were very cool. 
for it. Um, so they uh, they were all foreigners, but particularly Germans and um, Israelis. Uh, and so the those uh, basically Israel built its bomb, and the exchange was then South Africa did research into uh, eugenics, population bombs, ethnic bioweapons because Israel has an ethnic problem with Palestinians and South Africa has an ethnic problem with uh, uh, expanding black population. So they both sh shared the same problem and they both had the same idea for a solution. Here's the, the worrying bit is that they had help from all over the place, Belgium, Britain, you know, Portland down from Fort Dietrich, from America. They, they, all those guys that have never been exposed and Bota Basson will not expose them uh, they all tripping along happily. So, you know, it's the, the extent of this kind of thing is vast. Um, the lack of knowledge about it is vast. Um, and it's so dark and so dirty, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it. But the, uh, so, but there's always been this worry in me about this, the current thing and its relation to HIV. I read this paper of this Indian guy who said, um, you know, this, uh, it has features of, uh, HIV. So as soon as I heard that, I was like, mm, my, you know, antenna go up. Um, I think what it is is it's they're doing bio weapons research in, in all over the world, and they kind of farm it out to sleazy laboratories like in Wuhan, and then it probably you know escapes accidentally. But the that that's my best bet. But the I just want to I mean as for the the. Uh, origin of HIV story is like the the origin of HIV. I mean, I, it, it's guys, it's, it, that came out of a lab. I mean, for sure. And so what, the the only question is, what was the intent? Or was it accidental? Or was it, so the story of it is is uh, yeah. Well, uh, Bill Hamilton, you remember in the, my videos about um, Darwinism, I mentioned Bill Hamilton and Hamilton. So he was a famous guy had a lot of uh, input to evolutionary biology, and um, he believed that the HIV was was um, caused accidentally from uh, the polio button. and the the polio uh, was tested in the Eastern Congo, um, and they they tested it on the livers of um, of bonobos and chimps. So everyone knows that uh, HIV-1 comes from simian immune virus. And, it, and there are various strains in different, you know, chimps, bonobos, monkeys. Um, but uh, the, it almost definitely came from the program where they, they developed the, that polio hmm, because the um, there were the, I think there were three or four strains of HIV one, and they all emerged at the same time in the in the around fifty seven late just before nineteen sixty, when they developed and tested these mm. on uh, Eastern Congolese, and that's you know if you look at the map of where it started, it corresponds to where they did these. Um, mm. But the, um, what Hamilton believed was that they, because they used, um, I don't think it would happen today, but it, in those days they, they would just use, uh, say, the liver of, of these primates. And then, you know, at some stage, where, you know, they would come across SIV. <laughs> and then SIV would be in the well that they gave everybody. Um, so Hamilton went out to Africa in around 2000, I think, and uh, tried to get samples um, and to prove uh, this this theory and um, samples from, from wild chimps and bonobos and to show that those strains were, you know, proximal, I guess. Um, the current theory is, the, the non-conspiracy theory is complete horseshit. It's that, you know, some hunter got a cut or something while he's skinning a an animal. It's that's absolute fucking nonsense. Is a you can't you know the the they used to say oh it was some blood brothers ceremony that Africans did with monkeys or chimps and stuff. Look, 
I'm telling you absolutely, unequivocally, there's no fucking blood brothers ceremony between Africans and chimps. It's just man alive. How how come the that's not the conspiracy theory and that's the mainstream? It's just like oh man, talk about upside down world. But anyway, so so you cannot get you cannot get. Uh, SIV from a monkey you, you eat. It just doesn't work that way, even if you get an ulcer on your lip or whatever. It's just bullshit. And the proof of that is that in some tribes, like the pygmy tribes and stuff, they've been eating monkeys the you know, with a SIV for fucking centuries. And they, you know, the the mainstream virologists say, no, well, it, you know, HIV has been out there forever. It just didn't, it's like nonsense. It never came across in the slave trade, every, every Every other disease in Africa came across it, it. It it can be proven very very easily that it it starts at exactly the same time as they were doing these experiments. So, you know, the, so now the, the now the question is now, Will Hamilton assumed that it was accidental. It was just bad practice. But the, I, it's not so plain because the actual guys won't talk about it. They, they all cage you as a duck's ass. And that, to me, is, I never give them the benefit of that. I think that's the smoking gun in this case with, with China is, is that China's behavior says that they think it was a lab leak. So uh, you can be generous, like uh, Bill Hamilton was, and say that, oh, these guys just did it accidentally. But it's, it doesn't spot pass the smell test. They're all eugenicists, right? So if you have a look at the background of these people and that, it's not savory at all. And so the, you know, there's always this question is, was this, was HIV deliberately done as a bioweapon? Now, the, in, in the Air Force, we took it as red that, that it was deliberately constructed with South African help. Now you could say, oh, that's just bar stories and hearsay and stuff. And I'd say, I never heard any of these bar stories and stuff that didn't turn out to be true. So, you know, I just want to paint this picture of, you know, that the mainstream <laughs> is just so at odds with with this dark underworld that, uh, that I know. <laughs> and uh, I think maybe Kevin knows. It's, uh, it's, um, I, it's just... I just want to say, uh, just just watch out, you know, be on your guard. There's there's something that just smells, it reeks about this whole thing. And at a certain time in like 2020, the guys were waiting for 2020. It was 2020 was iconic. It was written in from 1972 in the limits to growth. They said, you know, all the predictions was shit breaks out in 2020. And then this comes. <laughs> it's like, guys, I just can't. I mean. I just wanted to express that because I just wouldn't feel right if I didn't share all of this with you. But that's that's where I'm coming from, is just be very, very careful about how this unfolds. The, the problem is, if it has an HIV component, you, you won't hear about it for years. It'll, it'll come out as compromised immunity, and compromised immunity means weird types of cancers. So it'll take a long time. If it, if it is some chimera, I think it'll take a long time before they figure it out. Um, this thing doubles at a rate of two weeks. So the entire Earth population would be covered in um, in about a year. So at a doubling rate of, of two weeks, you just do the maths. It's, exponential growth is extraordinary. And if this is an, um, in, you know, an R value, R naught of about two, um, yeah, the, it, it would basically most of the world's population would have this before long, long, long before they knew the long term effect. So the, it, you, you shouldn't, well, according to me, and I'm not a virologist, but you shouldn't listen to early reports that, that come out saying, oh, you know, it's highly infectious. But it's good news because it's, you know, it's not so so damaging and people are not <laughs> like, oh, no, don't believe that. And also, there's no such thing as an HIV jab, right? They've been trying and trying for 40 years. HIV is, think of it like Bruce Lee ninja virus. You, you will not get a vaccine. It's like, it's like trying to, you know, catch uh, 
Bruce Lee with a dog catcher's net. You're not going to do it, man. And so if, 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 if they rush out something, any kind of vax that has something, oops, I said the word. And if they rush out anything that has um, uh, the words HIV or the letters HIV or something associated with it, it's, it's like, or anti HIV in, in a few months, and that is like, I would never take it. Not, I would, not while I have my strength, I would never take it because the, the, they don't know what they're doing. Absolutely, they don't know what they're doing in, in that area. They, they it, you know, HIV is just the, the a demon from hell. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So, so what I'm trying to hint at is you, a prophylactic against anything with HIV is rushed out um, could give you the thing that it's trying to avoid. And it would be unintentional, not necessarily unintentional. So anyway, I just wanted to lay that out there and warn people for what it's worth. But, well, you know, you don't have to listen to me. Just keep your heads up and just be very, very skeptical. But I think this is going to be big. I think this G, G thing is the start of the pandemic. I'd say this is the start of the second wave. So we, we've had just yeah. been the first wave. All the, the media says, oh, fourth wave. And I was like, like that's bullshit. They, they, you know, we're in the first wave. Uh, if you go back and look at the 1918 virus, we're in the first wave. The second wave of the 1918 virus was the devastating one. And so I think this might be it. And so it's just a hunch, and I just sort of share it with you. Um, Hugh, what, what, uh, do you think there's any chance that even just the variations that have come along um, since this started uh, w were being deliberately seeded uh, because, uh, as I made in a comment there somewhere, that they, they always seem to begin somewhere in a, uh, you know, in an economically depressed country where, where uh, it would be very easy to just introduce the next version, which could already have been made and sitting on a bookshelf along with the original one, of course. Um, and, you know, so we've been through a few different versions and... Uh, Possibly now, you know, depending on the degree of conspiratorialness, you know, they might be saying, oh, well, you know, the population's getting really um, fed up with this. A, a lot of resistance, a lot of protesting and all that. Maybe we should be rolling out something a bit a bit stronger this time. Um, no, almost, I don't know. almost certainly not. Almost certainly mm. not. That, that's almost certainly not the case. And the reason is that... Um, the if you look at the mutation rate of uh stars um it it's is unusual for rna rna viruses don't normally mutate very fast but it it's it mutates very fast for an rna virus so um but the mutation rate is consistent with a sars mutation oh, okay. rate. Right. so there can't be anybody frigging with it because otherwise it'd be kind of like double uh, you know, you'd see double the mutation rate. So, my my estimate is that it's mutating at at the rate you'd expect. There's not nobody could be tinkering. Yeah. And the reason why it comes up in in these places in in Africa, everybody's everybody's sick. They go around, you know, with three or four deadly diseases and just go to work and get on with it. And so those those countries. Um, they have a lot of people that are immunocompromised. And so they, they, that somebody with an immunocompromised body, especially somebody that's going undergoing HIV treatment or something like that, or cancer treatment, they are great um, crucibles for mutating the virus. Because the virus kind of has free reign to experiment because it's not being bombarded by, you know, T cells and bodies that are trying to, trying to nail its coffin. So, so it can it can play. It can sit there and play and incubate, and then you know, it'll you know spread uh, different versions of itself while it sits there. So that's so it should, would be expected that some some place with poor healthcare would would generate all of them. So almost all the diseases, just talking conspiracies again. Almost all the deadly diseases. They're not many, by the way. They're it, they're probably about seven that humans are really you know, on nightmare ones. Um, and 
you know, one of them was polio, and that's gone. Uh, the the um, but uh, you know the it, it it is almost possible to you know they they can't do a sulk a general sulk thing and try and get rid of them although they've often dreamed of doing it you know psychopaths like Peter Dozak and stuff talk about shit like that but the the uh, you know there there are a relative handful and here's the amazing thing they all come from the Congo in fact so local from this one island in the Congo River that almost all of them come from. It's to the point that people have speculated that why not, why don't we just nuke that island and do, do the whole human races a, a favor? Um, they, they, they've looked at, at, the, at the origin and the, the, that island is kind of island of Dr. Moreau, I, I believe, but it's, it's, uh, it's got a lot of bats on it, which is a clue to, uh, and bats, um, bats incubate uh, a lot of, of viruses without, um, you know, basically getting, getting rid of them in the, in their bodies. So yeah, um, caves, bats are not healthy places. Um, and then anything you see, Chimps and bonobos and a lot of simians are clo they're so close to us that that the chances that they they can actually make a crossover are very high. The same of pigs are also very close. So so a great a great way to get viruses is keep ducks and pigs together like the Chinese. So the if if you the the biggest thing you could do for epidemiology is shut down all the all the labs trying to make you know, give employment to eugenicists, uh, shut them all down and just ban the Chinese from keeping, well, South Asians from keeping pigs and ducks in the same place. And that'll be pretty much the best thing that you've ever done in epidemiology in the last 10,000 years. This is so dark, <laughs> but um, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, yeah, this, um, I, I think, I think I'm going to contact Kevin anyway. What do you think, everyone? Just I know it's it's, a, it's heavy, but I think it would be very difficult to find somebody who could in, uh, give us a bit of information. I think he's quite good in the field. In spite, and, you know, I know he's not a virologist; he's a neuro, he's a neuroscientist or a neurophysiologist. So, but I, I think he's he's got a good um, he's got in his audience. He's got a lot of people who are who are in that field. So, what what do you think? Should I ask him to come on so we can discuss? Uh, yeah, I think it's a great idea. But okay. I wouldn't stop there. I would ask other people that are speaking freely. Yeah, but I don't think it should be a recorded meeting. I think we should, well, it, 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 he might want to record it himself. I would suggest if he wants to, but because he's, he's um, we, I don't know, would it even be uh, possible to, to post it because a lot of his stuff is being taken down so there's no point in 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 flagging the group with all this you know kind of stuff i i, I what do you think I, I got one i got one strike on youtube for the yeah. last one we did with him and it was just because of his name basically yeah yeah so, so um uh i would say we should do it but um let's let's do it after we've got the the manifesto so we can like Drop the manifesto on them and tell them, <laughs> tell them like, you know, you might want to just yes, chuck this. Yes, that's in. a good idea. That's the good idea. So I, I'll keep it on the back burner. I, I've still, I kept his email so because I, I had to leave his server on Discord because it was just, it was just nauseating. So yeah, I, I, I just couldn't I, look at it. I can't know. I, I, I enjoyed the information, but it's just, oh, yeah. it's just too much hard work. There's just too much craft and stuff. Yeah. Shit going on in this video. Okay. Okay. Well, does anybody want to say any more? Do they have any thoughts or stuff about about this this difficult subject? I'm just wondering about Gert Van Vandenbosch, uh, because uh, that Sophie mentioned because he uh, initially made some videos and then he stopped. Uh, 
And I think he made one last one, and I, I haven't seen him on YouTube since. Not that that would be surprising. Um, but, uh, you know, I would, I would know how to contact him. There must be some way to do it. Um, I, I guess, you know, whoever we deal with, we probably can't record, have it um, recorded anyway. So it's a private conversation. Um, um. Yeah, that's yeah. Oh, just one one last word I'd like to say on this before we go to just put it in perspective about um, how dark it is and stuff. It's it's like it's it's not it's kind of overhyped because okay, I did way back when it started. I did a back of a envelope calculation and it went went like this. It was like I just took. The, the known R value of the current thing just compared it to the 1918. So the 1918, if I remember it, was something like uh, something like twice as infectious, um, twice as lethal. The population in the Earth was about one quarter. So if you if you just take a, the maths and just run it simply like that on the back of an envelope, you come to 50 million. For 50 million was the the known death toll of the 1918 virus. I mean, more than that, because the common flu that you get now, the seasonal flu, is the 1918 virus. It never went away. It just um, became endemic. But but if you they commonly cite 50 million deaths as the death toll of the 1918 flu. Um, so the, uh, based on bloody bloody blah that I just said, it's it just it works out that you you probably can double what happened in 1918. So you come to 100 million. Now, 100 million people is nothing, nothing at all. It's uh, the Earth's net increase in population is 100 million in nine months. So in the time it takes to gestate a baby, there are a net increase of 100 million babies on the planet. So uh, you you have to take that into account in terms of, you know, and it's spread out, spread out over five years or, so, or more. So, you know, you've got to put that in perspective. It's not that that big a deal. It's, it's not that I meant I mean, by you, dark. You've got to put it, it's not that I meant by dark. Yeah. What I meant by dark is what you've talked about with the, the eugenicists and the, and the, the, you know, those, those projects that that's what I, meant by dark yeah that, that that is the more important thing so the important you know the important thing from the way i see it is is those things it's the social changes it's it's the casual way that liberals just chuck their freedoms in the bin just to, i mean it's that is the, really that's all it took i mean you know in the past there's people fought and died for for half the freedoms that people take for granted now and all you have to do is say, oh, boogeyman. And they're like, oh, fuck it. You know, freedom of speech. Oh, fuck it. Constitution, fuck it. <laughs> it's just like, really? After all the indoctrination you got in school, you fucking little liberals, toss out your all your, your freedoms and, and, you know, just just go with totalitarian. Really, I mean, that's how low we've sunk. Just to little toddlers, little fucking toddlers. is like they're realizing more and more is basically the adults today are – they, they're infantile to the extent that they essentially just precocious nine-year-olds with, uh, you know, basically with a good vocabulary. Uh, it's like, you know, but in, in essence, you know, underneath the skin, they, they, they are nine-year-olds, infantile, babies, toddlers. It's like, so that's the danger. It's that, it's that these, these guys that, you know, just, just say, oh, boo, and it's like, they're rounding up people and doing witch hunts and accepting apartheid and accepting, you know, digital passports and stuff. You know, when the trouble we went to South Africa did not to get rid of that, and you do that because it's just one little bug. For fuck's sake, man. I think here too, we, we've got more um, effective means of saying boo now than we did 100 years ago as well, which is probably adding into that. But there's much more uniformity of education than there was. Um, there's, you know, everything's much more cookie cutter in terms of human psychology. You, you know, if you, you go back to uh, pre-World War II um, and, uh, you know, you, you get a, 
you know, people who were self-educated, people who only went to school for two or three years, people who went to some, you know, there are big variation in, in the kind of origins of people's possible lines of thought. Um, the other thing I just wanted to remark about, you, you were talking about the sort of uh, date, the, the, the limits to growth projected date of now kind of thing, uh, you know, but it's also convenient that it's just about just slightly over the 100th anniversary of the Spanish flu where, where you have this, so you've got this kind of double anniversary which kind of, you know, reminds you of some of these uh, uh, murder stories where the criminal leaves behind a a, a, a clue. You know, uh, uh, was, wasn't there one you posted once? Was it a flower or I can't remember what it was, but some, some, some uh, serial murderer who always left behind the same thing at the scene of the crime to, to you know, identify uh it's kind of a tease to people who are looking for him. But, you know, I, I wonder whether yeah, that's Zodiac. happening here too. Yeah, the, mm -hmm. the Zodiac. Uh, yeah, yeah I can't funny. remember. Um, there was one, yeah, there's probably been any number of them, but I'm just making the point that, that you know, that there's some really sick, twisted joke might be going on with either or both of those anniversaries. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, since you want to go dark, I can... If Sophie thought that was dark, I can get a lot darker than that. <laughs> so there, there is an underground culture that you really don't want to know about, but you're going to hear now, so block your ears. The, uh, those guys, the Son of Sam, the Zodiac Killers, and that Jeffrey Dahmer, and that it's, um, it's rife. Well, the, those, they, those guys, it's... It's a kind of a, a meme. It was an early meme. And what those guys are doing is they have this belief that if you, uh, anybody that you murder in this life, you, you get as a slave as in the next life. I think it can, comes from voodoo. It probably has its origins in voodoo because it's an African idea. But they, they went over time to suppress that information because they found that people were doing copycat things. And what was happening was the serial murders were trying to one up each other. Now, now that you can't find the manifestos and stuff like that, but, um, but you see the, there, there were, you see, you get these fads and copycat things and, and it becomes a meme. And, and so the, the, this meme was going around certainly in the seventies and eighties until they, they censored it, um, but it still goes on underground. There's still guys that believe this thing, and they're in competition with each other to see who can become the biggest slave loan in the afterlife. Now, that's fringe. Uh, the, yeah, the Canadian guys and stuff. The problem is there's also the guy in a very suspicious character, which uh, if you speak to a Flemish or Dutch person, I can't remember what his name is, the hotel. I can't remember, but anyway, you speak to a Dutch person, they'll know who this guy is because he's notorious and very embarrassing in Holland. Um, but all of these guys, uh, if you look closely at them, then it gets dark real quick because they have connections. They're, they're always these tendrils that go out and they go out in the direction of the Epsteins and, you know, you get onto the Bill Gateses and stuff real quick. So, you know, if you're looking for dark conspiracy theories, if you look at those guys and look at what the, the courts did to them, they often let them off for mass murders, you know, serial killings and jailings, tortures with slaps on the wrist virtue. Um, and those, those guys have a history of not doing too well when they get into prison. They generally slip on the soap when they get into prison. So, they, so they, you know, if you want, <laughs> want to look at dark stuff, I suggest going, going down that avenue. But, See, the, Bill Gates is, is not a savory character by any stretch of the imagination. In, in 19, you know, anybody that like, in, in 2018, he was sprouting about how Africa's population needs to be controlled, taking active measures in, in that direction. And then anybody that like that and is, is real keen on jabs and has a very suspect, um, you know, eugenics history, it's like, you've got to watch out for a character like that, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> that, that doesn't add up right there. Uh, you know, if you know Silicon Valley types, are the most selfish, um, 
Ayn Randish bastards that you could possibly meet. That I've never met Bill Gates, but I, I've met, known a number of people that know him. And, and they all say the same. He's the most egotistical little cunt you've ever seen in your fucking life. The fact that he's concerned about Africans is like it, you can you can roll on the floor laughing. It's like yeah, you put together all his thing about you know machines to pick the grapes and stuff, and, and you know oh, you must depopulate Africa and and have a jab. You put those together, and there's like no ways you don't come up with a conspiracy. So Bill Gates, mm, this, that there's a rotten apple. Now the, the problem with those rotten apples, if you if you start looking, you see this mycelian web of all these rotten. You get very quickly to characters like Epstein and and the the guy in Belgium and stuff. And, and what they're doing is they're serving a you know an undercurrent of very evil stuff. Now the right wing knows about this instinctively. It's just they undo themselves with with stupids, you know, green adrenochrome kind of baby sacrifice and stuff but you see if you if they just stopped with all the nonsense about pizza parlors and stuff um you know they, they are actually right it's proven over and over again that it comes out and they, they must be very powerful people because they you know you get a little glimpse behind the curtain and then gets pulled back again so anyway it's not savory Uh, yeah, no, that's interesting. So what you're saying is they're, they're giving this a kind of um, uh, curiously unrealistic em, um, embellishment based on some, some things that are actually going on. Yeah, they, you see, they, they, a lot of the right-wing guys are in the military, so they know, and they know somebody who knows somebody that knows something. But you see, if you put that through a Christian lens and you start talking about the four horsemen and stuff, then you very quickly, you know, it gets tainted and becomes, you know, Satan and then they're all Satanists. Well, they, yeah, they, they all, they're all Satanists, but so, so are the guys who worship the guy with the white beard. They're all the same, but they, they, uh, you know, if you, all the stuff that goes on in Bohemian Grove and stuff, it's, it's fairly innocent, but it's also, a club of people that don't know where innocent ends and should, you shouldn't do starts. But as far as I can see, is they're bored. I mean, it's exactly as you think. It's like if you had unlimited amounts of cash, it's it's not good. You're gonna you're gonna explore um, shit that you shouldn't just for kicks. You run out of ways of getting kicks if you if you're super rich. Is is my conclusion. And so so this it's you know they say power corrupts and. Stuff well, you know, everybody thinks, oh, it means you become a tyrant. No, it means you become a deviant. They're all deviants, right? And the problem is deviancy is normalized. So the right wing has that bit right. All their instincts are right. But then they go and undo themselves because they're, they're clueless and ignorant about the world and they don't really have access to those those echelons. So they, they do bad reporting on, on the truth. So they, the right wing are just do misinformation and reports. But the problem is that the, the liberal mainstream goes, say, oh, no, that's inform misinformation. They say, no, it's bad reporting about the truth. So it's unfortunate. But, and, and, and then there, there is also always the possibility, talking conspiracies, that, that they do that de deliberately. You see, they, they have a history all going all the way back to the OSS and stuff. Is is you deliberately put out a madcap conspiracy theory that's so mad that nobody could believe it, and then it covers up a, something true, like a say development of a secret aircraft or something. So, so some, at least some of the UFO stories that came out of Area 51 they were to cover skunkworks projects, and they worked like a dream. Whenever anybody saw something, they misreported it as the UFO instead of the, you know a aircraft development program. So, you know, it, it works, that kind of um, deliberate seeding of the, uh, of, the, of the ground in conspiracy theories, just making conspiracy theories odious is a good way of inoculating the population against novelty or, or any strangers. So, so, so the liberals don't know how to differentiate um, 
you know, exaggerated reports from from the truth. They're just not equipped to. So they, they just automatically write off anything new and strange. So the, again, this is the same thing with the flipping. They, they automatically, without any evidence, just grasp at any straw to discredit the messenger. So that because it's just easier for them. They don't want to know. They they are desperate not to hear that they've been indoctrinated in school, that the people that they loved most as school teachers and primary school teachers and their, their trust figures like doctors and people in white coats, they're desperate to, to not hear that those people are actually against you. So they, they don't want to see evil. They'll do anything not to see evil. So, so you know, you, you can... Anything you can get a Karen and Ripple can like drop a few bits of uh, misinformation from Yale, and then it's like, okay, that's been debunked. And then fact checkers echo the debunking and amplify it. And then before you know it, um, you know, uh, a good bit of information is buried about a mile deep. And, and what I, you see, I made a mistake. And when I started out making videos, I've naive, I didn't know anything about social media, I avoided it like crap, but. I didn't, I naively thought that we were in a different era. I think Fawlty's making this mistake too, where, you know, where people are outraged, people go and look into it. It's like, I realized to my cost, nobody does that. Nobody gives a shit. No, nobody, I thought you could drop some hints and people would pick them up, follow them, and then get outraged. And I found out that the world is gone because nobody gets outraged. What happens now, apparently, is people, people look at shit, go, Oh, you hurt my feelings. Oh, that's dark. Oh, you made me feel bad. Oh, you're a, down, you're a bad person. Downvote, swipe right, and carry on. And that, that's all you get. It's like, yeah, it's just a question of, do you make me feel good or bad? If you make me feel good, I'll listen to you. If you make me feel bad, it's like, fuck off. I need any excuse will do to shut you up, cancel you, deplatform you, shut you down. And so, so you know, it's hard, very hard to reach people. So I thought, well, you can reach people by starting a cult. And so at this stage, I just think, look, you can walk up to people, beat people over the head with the two by four that says the flipping is coming and they still wouldn't fucking get it. So it's like, I thought like, well, hell, all the caution and shit that I went to is like, you, you can't reach anybody anymore. So it's just pe people won't even research shit. People won't even be not, people are not even skeptical. They won't even look at it. You see, if, if you, any one of these things that I said, if you, if you pick up the trail and go and look, you will quickly go down a rabbit's hole where you think, oh my fuck, everything is just pointing in this direction. True after true after true, just basically the amplifier. So, so nobody does that. Nobody does that. It's like, you know, do I like, it's, it's the only way I can see is uh, putting information out there's like John Oliver, where you, you treat people like little children and you try and put together you know, stuff in the old days would have made people go, you know, that's outrageous. And now, you know, it has to be inserted with all this infantile, infantile little fart jokes and hers, <laughs> and it's just just for fucking public. And and then John Oliver gets Pulitzer Prize awards and and Emmys and stuff for 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 his reporting. See why? I mean, it's insufferable. I can't watch it. I don't want to gag. But but. Now I see why. It's that's the only way uh, you can talk to to adults these days. Is is they are literally toddlers. Unless you put you know dancing zebras and stuff, you can't talk to them about a serious subject. So so yeah, I finally realized why where John Oliver's at, and you know stop despising him so much. I guess. But, but Hugh, anyway, um, just as you're talking there, I don't, I'm not quite sure why, but I'm I'm. Uh, thinking about the problem or the situation that ex seems to exist on the right where uh, it's been very noticeable lately because they're very much uh, against uh, the kind of authoritarianism that's going on at the moment regarding the illness. And, um, you know, the number of times that I've been able to read and, or look at that kind of material and it just, they seem to be right on the, right on the, target you know the, the, the understanding of it and the, uh, what they're saying but in the very same breath the same people will be saying oh and all this climate change conspiracy bullshit that's going on as so though they're absolutely blind on one side and uh, uh, you know believe in, in uh, 
that you know the whole thing is a uh, is just a, a you know a, a fanciful story, and yet on the other side of it, regarding um, the, you know the authoritarianism and that kind of thing, that they're completely with it, and. I was trying to, I think there was just something in what you were saying that was beginning to unravel that for me, but I can't quite get my brain onto it. Um, uh, have you got anything there you can say about that? Yeah, you see, the, the, they are our allies in the sense that they're libertarians and they have strong libertarian and anti-authoritarian instincts. They all go wrong very quickly because they go into climate change denial and then they go into anti-semitism and then they go into christianity and this kind of biblical um, apocalypse and so you know they they're their own worst enemy if they're just a little more strategic drop the anti-semitism and you picked up a book and actually looked about climate change then then they they would uh they might actually get somewhere well i mean maybe they think they're getting far enough as they are uh, you see, the, 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 the right wing is always served an ace by, by, by the left, just because the left is the left. <clears throat> so in 2022, brace yourselves. Because if, if I'm right about the Xi variant being the one <laughs> that you should have worried about, and by the way, I'm going to say, look at that post that I said about epigenic sin. So, so one of the reasons why you don't want to rush out and get an early jab is your your T cells, they kind of fight the last war. So they'll they they will fight, they will respond uh, with antibodies to the first variant that you were exposed to. So if you get a jab, it's for the for the alpha variant. If the, you know you want to hold off because the alpha variant's not that bad, you want to hold off until basically something like really really bad comes along, so that you make sure that that's the one you're fighting. What they they're making a huge mistake, I think, because of this concept of epigenic sin is with is is they they're priming the world's population for the alpha variant, um, and this is unlikely to be the super variant. So G variant it might be the super variant. In in other words, immune response to the wrong variant. So they they it just goes to show you why this mandating and this heavy arm stuff to try and you know coerce you you know take away your your own judgment um, uh, is so wrong, because you know you have a right to make these kind of assessments and. And research and decide which variant you want. One, and it, it's criminal, you know, for what they're doing. But uh, um, yeah, anyway, the, so I wanted. To, oh, but anyway, what was the the thing? I just got diverted the on the epigen. Oh, it's it, so 2022. Yeah. So so I want to paint this scenario. If I'm right, and the the G variant is is the dog. Um, imagine in 2022 the election. So basically, where the the left always um, has an on goal, and they do they always do woke, they they always do you know critical race theory and stuff, and and they always so self assured and conceited and convinced they're on the right side of history. The arrogant fucks always you know hand it over to the right. So in 2022, you know Biden Biden's gonna you know probably either fall asleep or otherwise uh, pop his clogs right, you know, I mean, long before he gets to the end of this term. So, so you know, it's, it, you know, if, if Harris is, a, is the president with a, a 2022 backlash election, uh, that's not cool. Uh, but the, the left almost always hands it as a gift to the right just by being the fucking left. And so they need to get over that shit. They need to get over woke. They need to um, what get are, over pretending yeah. that they're not woke and woke isn't a thing. But, but I'm yeah, just I wondering. Mean, what... We're heading for totalitarianism again is Trump hasn't gone anywhere. And, and yeah. They, they, yeah. they are setting it up. They're teeing it up for him for 2024. So, so it, I, you, you can see it all converging there. So, you know, just saying get ready for 22, a massive backlash in 2022. Well, there's two things. Can I say two things there? Um, 
One is that uh, uh, what I think is the horseshoe effect, which I think you spoke of once before, which is you're going to get the authoritarianism one way or the other anyway. Um, uh, just to go back a little bit earlier, um, uh, I was just thinking about cons uh, the right in terms of conservative. And uh, do you think that uh, their, their denial of climate change is simply uh, comes out of their conservatism, that they, has, they just can't um, get their brains around change and climate change threatens massive change? Uh, and so, therefore, they just go into denial because it's just too much of a a thing to contemplate in in terms of of well being being you know staying the same. Is that just a, is that too simplistic a way of looking at it, or is it anything? No, else? no, that's the way I see it because they they seem to me to be like the conservative South Africans that would would just you know talk down the obvious. They would shoot down the obvious. At every turn, and the, you could see what they're doing is they they were doing what liberals now do with down votes on social media is they they just trying to avoid looking at the obvious that's coming is that they can't cope with what they know is coming emotionally, so the simplest way to deal with it is to pretend it doesn't exist and just then you can use any flimsy and evidence as an excuse to to for your denial. But the, there again, the left is handing them, a, you know, basically a big prize because the 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 left, you know, takes an issue like uh, that's genuine ecological and climate collapse, which is the genuine issue. Uh, all the tech billionaires then start the ESG and green tech industry, which is a complete fuck up and is like utterly superfluous and will actually make things worse. And then you know, squeezes, you know money out of the government like a socialist for all these green programs which are actually carbon intensive so the so they hand the excuse to the right because the right says oh no all of this stuff is to make money and they can cite all the things where all these boondoggles and basically unscientific nonsense like solar panels and wind wind harms are you know basically just money making schemes for rich green tech entrepreneurs so they point to that and say and where they absolutely right but then come to the con false conclusion and say, well, that explains climate change, is it's just a, a, you know, a gold rush, money-making scheme. I say, no, it is a gold rush and money-making scheme, but it doesn't mean that climate change isn't real. And they don't like that because then they know that's what the truth is. So, well, anyway, I think they're, too, they're, they're, you know, the Greens, the left, everybody, they hand it to them on a plate with, with all this so-called climate action. But the other side of it is that the right don't seem to be particularly um, self-analytical, you know. I mean, that's I suppose it goes with the package. So um, that's their strength. Yeah. The, that's their strength. You see. Yeah, but the, it's their the, it's the, their the, it's, the, it's, the, it's yeah. I know it's their strength, but at the same time, it's a weakness. Uh, you know, it depends what uh, particular. So, so it's a short-term strength and a long-term weakness. You see, the, the, the left's problem is they can't get out of the starting gate because they have analysis paralysis and morality uh, analysis paralysis and stuff. So they they argue and finesse and it's like, you know, if you if you heard like communists and these, if you hear these Trotsky's trot, they're just endless verbiage and analytics and stuff and they just can't get their fucking act together. And so, you know, they, they all, it's basically Monty Python, the same damn things. It's the uh, people's front of Judea problem. So the left is all the people's front of Judea where their hair split and get, you know, turn out to be Pharisees endlessly arguing minute and can never get to action. The right gets to action really quick. They're all unified. They can all agree just by instinct. And, uh, but, but then, you know, it unravels on them in the long term because the consequences of goose stepping off into the future are severe. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes, no, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my, my reflection on what you're saying is that um, there, is a, there is a background that reminds me of our first conversations when we were 
um, when and you had posted all these Adam Curtis uh, videos on 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 the programming on the on this all this whole thing that's been going on for the last 50 60 years and in society and uh, I, I I'm, I'm kind of in myself I, I can recognize this a reticence to um, to sometimes look at the dark because as you said you know the teachers the parents the the whole thing that we have constructed in our in our belief system and I, I can understand very well where 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 all these people are and uh, I, I, I I am deconstructing gradually over the years and my experience is helping me my age etc so yes there is this and I, I could feel that with the people I met yesterday who are kind of opening their eyes but there's some areas where they don't want to go and it's uh, before we go to the manifesto and the and the sigil I think it would be interesting to hear um that's is Petra there because this is deeply psychological this is this is we, we we're threading in a place people don't want to see they don't it's, want to see this it's, this it's, this, also, you know? it's also a mock you so it's yeah. also a mock you so getting into the psychology and stuff it, it's a deadlock so you can go and analyze the psychology like a left-wing rabbi uh for all you like you're just wasting time it's just just cut through to the chase and say look all of these things are conceits the flippening is coming it's like you're wasting precious time. It's like you forget the psychology, the stuff. The, the psychology is, is too late. I, I realized in 2018 that you, the psychology is too in, too um, entrenched. You, you, it's it's a magic deadlock. If, if you take the layered brain and uh, it's basically it puts us into psychological deadlock, so that we it, in the past it served us well as a species because. Conservatism is good in the hunt together. Um, Neanderthals were very, very conservative. And it's good for, you, you see, the danger as a, as a hunt together is you go off on a tangent and do something real lemming and stupid. Um, unfortunately, we put ourselves in a position where lemming and stupid on a mass scale is required. We, we need shamanic psychosis. And everything is designed to prevent that. So you just have to cut through to the chase and say, it's it's macchio to even start analyzing it. In fact, psych psychology as it's been taught, and sorry, Petra, but psychologists in general are actually a hindrance because all they can do is reinforce the status quo. They don't have the language, they don't have the background, they've been, they've been put in upside down world. And all they can do is try and patch up, put the world together, keep the concentration camp going. So they are. I think the it was. Um, uh, here, I got, I got a, it might have been Ramana Maharshi. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, or Nisa Gadada maybe made the comment in one of his talks. He said, well, What was the point in, in, in uh, examining the contents of the rubbish that you've got to throw away anyway uh, in regard to dealing with the exactly. psychological issues? Exactly. Mm. I, th I think yeah. that's where we must move on to with, with the the whole pivot towards, oh, excuse the pun, to, to, to the manifesto and just putting the flipping front and center is you're just saying, look, stop examining the garbage. Um, it's, it's all being thrown out. Just move, move on. And, and uh, can I just, can I just jump in? Psychology. That is the best psychology you need is not, no, just stop psychology, stop psychology. Hey. Just, that's the best psychology you can do. Petra, c can you? Petra, are you? Have you got another? I think it's your microphone, Petra. Have you got something unusual happening there? I don't think the others can hear you. No, no. I think I don't think Hugh or Sophie can hear you. But the other thing that's happening is, is your um, you you it's showing on the screen that your mic is turned off. But in fact, we can hear your your kitchen so there's just something a bit strange something strange is happening with you yeah yeah that it might be yeah no 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 Hugh, Hugh and sophie can you hear petra no she, she's uh muted no they still the... they still can't hear you petra yeah 
Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Can you uh, maybe just use the phone by itself and, and turn the headphones off? Or maybe if, if you're using... No, no, go, go out and come back in again. That normally works. Get it to disconnect. Make look, make sure it's disconnected and then reconnect. I'll go right out of the whole thing. Yeah, sorry. I see what you're saying. I, I think she might have another Bluetooth thing turned on. That, that happens to me sometimes. If you've got two of them turned on at the same time, you get a strange effect occasionally. Yeah, people were complaining on YouTube saying, like, can't you bastards, you know, afford a pair of cheap headphones or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I don't know. You probably can't hear it, but I can hear all the noises from Petra's kitchen. You, I don't know. You probably can't hear it. Couldn't hear it, no. no. No, it's quite a lot of noise. I, 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 I didn't know if you could hear it or not. Um. Gary? Yeah, oh, okay. I'm, I can hear. hear. Oh, okay, it's oh, right. Okay, okay. So, go yeah, ahead then. I was trying to talk yep. a few times before, and, and I, I realised you couldn't hear me. It was quite strange. Um, yeah. I, I, just to jump back earlier uh, when you were talking about the the right not uh, being critical of authoritarianism in a way that resonated but not at all uh, being climate deniers, I noticed that too, and I don't know if you recall, Hugh, but I asked you almost an identical question two weeks ago. What I, what I observe is the collapse in respect for experts because we can no longer trust them. Like Hugh says, it's their instincts and the instincts are correct, that they, they put the, same, the experts in the same category. That's what I've noticed because I've been digging into that question has really interested me too lately, Gary, as I feel this sense of, yeah, wow, these are the only folks who are critiquing authoritarianism, yet they're anti-climate science. And I think they think all of the science is captured and all of it's a lie to promote a particular kind of, you know, well, Gates, etc. So, Petra, do you think that comes out of the, the sort of, the, I mean, I'm just, my impression is that the right thinks that the, the universities are completely owned and controlled and, and influenced by the left. And so completely. when you get, when so when you get, experts coming along they assume well these are university conditioned people uh, and therefore we automatically can't trust them because they're left indoctrinated uh, that's so right possibly and i agree with collapse you. go on sorry yeah yeah i agree with you that the instinct is correct but it ends up being overkill or overreach because then they reject the whole lot they throw the baby out with the bathwater. but it's essentially that it's all become partisan so what is said as far as i can tell that's not important it's who said it to the extent that the same thing can be said by different people and heard from one person and not another so it seems to me now that people in general have become incredibly tribal and that, that's really happened in the last five years or so. This is created by social media and anxiety. And so what we're seeing now is, which is why we are a bit discombobulated because we can hear the right speaking and hear a kind of truth there, but most people who are on the left can't. Likewise, people on the right cannot hear they can't hear a climate scientist speak because they just go, yeah, they just go, oh, that's just a product of the university. He's just woke or she's just woke. And so they can't hear it and they think it's captured. And it is captured science. But, yeah, I think there's some conflation there where experts aren't in any sense um, respected anymore or seen to be speaking the truth and there's an intuition in that that's accurate and it's, in, it's entirely partisan. So that's now seen as a left issue. That, that's yeah, that's it. interesting. Yeah, and I'm, I'm interested. It's, it's, uh, it's good that you've said that. The um, other comment I wanted to make when I tried to it, uh, jump in. Before I, I, I mean, it's good to hear it from you because you've got that, you've got that uh, experience in that realm, you know, so it's, it's interesting to hear that. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and I think what Hugh was saying earlier I found interesting as well about conspiracies. So I've been at a group today, like a few of you, I'm kind of trying to connect with people outside of this system, and one of the women in the group was saying the ABC, so that's our national broadcaster for those who aren't Aussies, <laughs> um, ran a whole series on conspiracy theories this morning apparently, and, and it's that same thing where everything is considered a conspiracy, that there's no willingness to so. Geert, what's his name, Van Boschen, you know, a number of these scientists, Peter McCulloch, who have been critical of the lockdowns or critical of the mandates or even critical of the V itself, um, are not given any kind of 
any room on the ABC. They're no longer even attempting to hear another side. It's just dismissed outright. And I find that it's, it's about novelty, yes, but it's also, I think it's also about fear and it's about what you were saying before, Hugh, where they're just completely ready in, in like what, one or two years to just hand over all of the freedom. But I think the other piece that's tricky here, and I think I heard Eric Weinstein saying this a while ago, is that both conspiracy theories and novel ideas often come from the same heterodox place. It's outside orthodoxy and having that capacity to critically evaluate them is what's missing. So there's just this blanket rejection. But I think it is true that they both tend to come from the lunatic fringe. You know, I mean, in, in so far as any great scientific revolution or revolution in our thinking has typically been rejected first and then accepted as truth later. And there'll be a price to be paid, whether it's Galileo or whoever. And I, But it seems now that there's no willingness to even accept that as part of the process. So anything that isn't in line with the dominant hegemonic viewpoint now is just dismissed as conspiracy theory and people can't get out of that I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist I think it's better to claim it now and go yeah that's called critical thinking and some of it's dross and some of it might be useful yeah there's no useful end to be gained by getting over this problem right there's no if you could magically make a wave or what magic wand and make it go away, it doesn't achieve much, right? You mean See, the I mean, problem of conspiracy? Is, mm -hmm. No, I mean just be, just having the public discourse be functional. Uh, mm -hmm. The the whole idea of having a functional public discourse comes from a silly place, and that the silly place is liberals believe that this you can have some dialogue come to some consensus it's a mammalian brain thing that it's we can all be agreeable we can find the truth through consensus and then get to a good place all of it is horseshit from the left so it comes from liberal indoctrination it is part of liberal humanism and the the you know part of the enlightenment ideal so it's enlightenment idealism that this is even a problem so it's like you have to leap over it and say like what if, what does it matter at, at this stage uh you know the greenhouse you, so at this stage the the arctic is going to melt the boe is baked in as a certainty we passed the tipping point the greenland ice sheet has been so for 20 years and the clath rates are going to go off so it really doesn't matter a shit what the public dialogue is. It doesn't matter what the consensus is. It doesn't matter if you're an XR and you campaign everybody. And now you've raised awareness. And now basically, you know, raising awareness and getting consensus does not translate into saving anything. There's not a tadpole that is going to be saved by getting everybody to start being functioning. That's what the liberals need to get over. Is, is that their whole, the whole basis of their belief is that we can do consent we can reach a consensus and do consensus action the the horror that they cannot come to terms with is the fact is is all their liberal conceits is the individual and the collective doesn't matter it hasn't mattered for a while get over it liberal democracy is dead it doesn't matter about the dialogue it doesn't matter about joe rogan and all the analysis and what will make things right is we are past that that is the part of the garbage that is going out. It's time to move on. Mm. I have to think about that. Because <laughs> we still, Basically, if we're going to... You see, yeah. you see it's, again, it's this more, you know, liberals, every, everybody's in upside down world. But you see, they all say, you know, liberal, the liberal shtick is to say, if we just, you know, sort the right way out, I don't know words our way and the way we were indoctrinated in you know, liberal education, then everything would be okay. So, no, that's upside down world. The thing is, the first step is nothing is going to be okay. So stop all that shit about trying to gerrymander and tinker and do social engineering and raising awareness. And it's like all of that stuff is a waste of time. You're running around like a headless chicken in front of a steamroller. And ironically, mm -hmm. The quickest path to getting to what you want is everybody to, <laughs> to shut up and concentrate is to basically let that message is to say, guys, it's over or everything you're talking about is too late. So, you know, 
you can have endless discussions about the left and the right and the stuff. Nobody's saying the one discussion, the one thing we need to say is like, guys, it's too late. This conversation should have died in the 70s. The conversation now we have in should have died in the 70s. It's too late. Yeah, I'd like to comment on your point about therapy or psychology. I'm not actually a psychologist. I'm a therapist. My my work was in sociology, but I still practice that. I don't think that's irrelevant if it's a process of witnessing, as I think I talked with you a little bit about in an email. It's not about making people better to fit into the system. Absolutely, that's too late and morally reprehensible. But it's possible to bear witness and to speak in truth and to support each other, like say this group does to some degree or the group I have a physical meeting with does. So that in itself is a form of therapy. I think you can distinguish or you could call it something else. You could also call it friendship and support. But we can distinguish the kind of medical industrial version of therapy, which is to make people better to fit in. And then there's other kinds. I don't know how that sits with people, but I don't think the only kind is that medical kind. Yeah, I think that's the good kind. Uh, I mean, that's the kind of thing on, you know, our collapse has a thing for our remedial or our therapy. Or <laughs> but... But, um, yeah, I'm not seeing a lot from the mainstream. And in fact, I think you could lose your credentials if you, you could be struck off for, for yeah. being a doomer therapist. Right? Yeah, you'd be called, you'd be accused of traumatizing people. Yeah, and I, I think what people need is trauma. Is this, this idea, see, why I say they're basically propping up the, the concentration camp is that all pitch towards avoiding trauma. It has, they don't have access, they've lost the knowledge of shamanism and the value yeah. of trauma, basically as trauma as a healing. I mean, it's known in the fringe. There's, there's a, a book you can read called um, the, some, something about the healing trauma or something like that. The way, oh, the way of, the way of, uh, the way of trauma, something on those lines. But anyway. Is that the body remembers? That's another one. The body remembers about trauma. Yeah, but uh, no, I'm talking about the value of trauma, the, of mm -hmm. inducing trauma, the exact opposite mm -hmm. to what. So, so, There's so, that um, concept of the wounded warrior. Um, I think ah, yes, the way of the wounds. That way of the wounds. Yeah. That's what that book is called. So it it has been raised, you know, by by many uh, clinical psychologists and therapists, but it's been smacked down equally hard. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I think you have to, to be a Duma therapist, uh, you can't change the system. It, you'd have to wait for the current guys to die off. Um, but it's too, too far gone for them to, to have access to shamanism. But the, the people in South Africa and, and psychiatrists and things like that are, that have looked at Sangomas and shamanism in, in Africa and then been convinced that that's the way to go. There's another stream that's going down the psychedelic route. But the mainstream is lost. They're, they're, they're actually equivalent to people on the Titanic telling people that they don't have anything to worry about when clearly the ship is going down. Yeah, absolutely. And conversely, mental health has now become the only way of getting out of things. So a friend of mine who's still in the university system says that's what everyone uses now for extensions or days off or it's, it's a sort of new religion. It can't be questioned, whereas everything else can be. Um, people are forced. Mental health every, day, yeah. I'm taking yeah, mental yeah, that's health right. day. Everyone's forced in every single way to do what the authoritarian governments and corporations want but somehow mental health is this only way you can get out of stuff so everyone's having mental breakdowns which which i'd say 50 percent are faux and 50 percent are real but there's no other language of resistance now so but it's quite insidious because as a language of resistance it sort of induces and cultivates victimization yeah but there's also another problem and that's that big pharma likes it Big pharma yeah. promotes it because there's a lot yeah. of money to be made in anti anxiolytics and um, you know Zoloft and uh, you know and the opioid crisis is uh, you know they're thriving off uh, mental health epidemic. So, exactly. so they love yeah. it and they're promoting yeah. it. They they're saying they you know, 
they promote the, the idea of pain and you know, existential pain is the same as physical pain and they, they love all of that stuff so that you know the, the, the industrial complex is, loves this um, this mental health epidemic that they are contributing to yeah I think I agree. there's another there's another point there because um, I went part the way down that road myself. Uh, in, in uh, various misadventures along the way, and I think what became obvious was that you uh, you could take this exit ramp using the excuse of some kind of mental uh, breakdown. Uh, but m when I observed most people who were further down the track of that path, they they had bought into it themselves. In other words, they didn't realise that they needed to get out to access a place of sanity, they um, they ended up believing the sort of psychotherapeutic medical um, message and then cast themselves in this role of being, of, of actually having this illness or this disorder. Um, and, and of course, so that even though they got out of the system, they were, they were just, um, they were not liberated. That they they were chained to the. To, I'm sorry, I'm probably not explaining this very well. They they were sort of chained to their belief in the particular syndrome and in, in, in whatever they had been diagnosed with, because it had been at the same time their ticket out at the other. But then they'd let themselves get imprisoned by it. Yeah. So the this is a very good point because um, this this is something very relevant for collapse because. The people are tying themselves, especially with this over uh, prescription and stuff, they're tying themselves to the industrial system that's going away. So what's likely to happen is it will be a very bad path, that, that path of taking a label and then, you know, getting, uh, having a, a note to teacher so you don't have to take part in the industrial madness is is very dangerous in the collapse of the system because the first thing that is going to happen is is probably what Alliston was all about. And that's, you, they will give you a UBI, they will give you social programs and the expansion of socialism is going to be huge under right or left wing because it's not really so socialism, it's, it's state totalitarianism. So the right will do it with, um, you know, kind of uh, impact tokens and, th and things like that. They, they will pri do it in a privatized way, private-public partnership, and the left will do it in an entirely socialist way. But you'll get the same result, and th that is you, you will be put out to sea, but it will come with strings attached, and your life will be a hell of monitoring and, you know, prodding and um, nudges, and all these these kind of surveillance things that will keep you on a path, which, which uh, the suicide rate will go up tremendously in that regime. Now, the the um, that that's the early stage. the The late stage it winds up in a gas chamber because uh, what I've said over and over again is, wh when they take responsibility for you, in other words, you you, be you become a domesticated animal, right? They will feed you while you can work or do something or add to the system. You, you know, if you take a UBI and you, you start sucking on the social teeth, you have a function. You're basically boosting the stock of all these these companies and state, you know, State Street, BlackRock, and and all these hedge funds. They they're gonna make money out of you. So you have uh, you you basically have a, a reason for your existence. As the system collapses, they will no longer be, be able to afford you. So you'll be put out. So you know, like a farm animal, if they put you out to pasture, sure they can do it while in times of luxury. But when things get bad, and they start to decide who gets fed, you are at the end of the list. You see, this is what I say is like. Guys, get over your fucking anti-Nazism and anti, you know, looking everywhere for anti-Semitism and stuff. Go and understand the concentration camps and go and understand what really happened in those death camps. The first thing is they are not death camps. They are labor camps. They uh. become death camps when they can no longer extract labor and they can no longer feed them. Now, you are in exactly that position. 
while they have your labor and they can do you can do a bullshit job that supports the you know white collar economy yes you've got a place and they will give you socialized medicine and but it will decay this whole system is decaying we, there are droughts coming we are at the limits to growth at the limits to growth they will start rationing you as a, somebody on the peripheral on the peripheries will be part of their surplus population and that's when they start culling you so that, that's why all these conspiracy theories of depopulation and stuff if they're not real now they soon will be because the system will not be able to support the masses as soon there's going to be uh, food shortages grain shortages and the system will not be able to support socialism it's you t you know everybody talks about sweden and norway as being social ideals and say oh you know socialism works there talk to somebody from norway before you say that crap social systems in norway are crumbling they cannot afford them because they 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 predicated on growth oil, right? So that basically the fossil fuel, every social program you've ever had is predicated on oil. So just, just get that through your head is that when, when you're farmed down, it'll first be in an Allison kind of way, which is, you know, basically you'll have a, an electronic collar in effect on you. Uh, and then eventually when they can't feed people anymore, they'll find more and more reasons why they slowly call you off. So, so you you are taking the, the phenobarbital, you are taking the Kool-Aid. This is not the way to go. Get, get over can I, can I, I, I don't know if I'm going to derail you here or not. Just uh, tell me if you don't want to go there. Uh, but I was thinking about... Uh, where we just started off a minute ago with, with, with uh, where Petra was saying, you know, people who are um, the only exit they could get that was uh, legitimately allowed or accepted now was just sort of psychological breakdown route. Um, but there's a, another aspect of that. I, I guess a more positive one. I just want to run past you and just see if you, you're interested in making a comment. Um, <clears throat> and... Uh, uh, you know, over the years of reading various interesting people and uh, uh, books, works of art, any music, anything like that, uh, not so much 20th century stuff, but, you know, uh, 19th century, certainly. Um, I, I found again and again there was a kind of a... Uh, I mean, it's probably not a good term, a kind of intellectual shamanism. In other words, traditionally, the shaman would be the one who, who was a little bit different and had some peculiar qualities, and he would go out by himself, uh, even though he might return to the tribe to fulfill various functions. He, he was a, uh, you know, the, 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 the shaman or the witch or whatever would be, um, uh, you know, somewhat of a, a in a unique position. Um, and I started thinking about this. Yeah. yeah, I, I started well, thinking uh, about this in terms of labeling. people. Yeah, but I, I just want to just just let me finish the little story. I'll try not. I'll try to to condense it. Is that uh, I eventually when I I actually got very annoyed because I was looking at people who were creative and turning out lots of very interesting stuff. And uh, I remember one day arriving at Franz Kafka, and. Uh, seeing how, in a way, he got a certain privilege from being ill with tuberculosis because it got him away from his job and enabled him for a little while to indulge his, his creative, uh, you know, what he really wanted to do, which was to write and to comment, make social commentary. Um, and I realised that, 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 you know, what Petra is describing here is that the mental breakdown, is the psychological breakdown exit, that, that uh, you know, a lot of people in the 19th century were using their physical ailments, uh, and I ended up calling it Kafka's syndrome, just to give it a name, <laughs> because there seemed to be so many creative people that conveniently ended up with tuberculosis, and, oh, look, well, I can't do anything else, so I've just got to spend all my rest of my life composing magnificent music. You know, I think this was <laughs> one of them. You know, and so I ended up with this concept of... Uh, of Kafka's syndrome, but just the reason why I'm mentioning it now, because 
it actually applies probably to most of the people on this call, and I think especially to, to Hugh, is that you have got a, you've been able to arrive at a position in your life, and I have, and, and I, I think um, Sophie has, where we've, we've, uh, able, we have been able to step aside from it. And it's put us in a privileged position in a way to, to think and get a perspective on things, and especially in Hugh's case, to write and, and be, you know, genuinely creative and helpful. Um, and so I'm just, I, all I wanted to do in just mentioning this was just compare, just set the two things side by side, that a different, that in a way, this kind of escape uh, uh, by, via Kafka syndrome is a, uh, is a, um, uh, how could you put it? it, it is it, is the, um, the 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 more the, is the productive end of, of, of the productive way of doing this? It doesn't lead you down this death camp medicalization ph pharmaceuticalization pathway. So I, I just if that makes any yeah, sense. Yeah, the, the 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 problem is it's fundamentally philandering. So you know <laughs> it's it gets you out of the 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 army, it gets you out, you know, it's basically Blackadder trying to avoid going over the top with uh, pencils and a, pencils in his nose and underpants on his head, if you've seen that episode of Blackadder <laughs> Goes For. But the, um, the problem with, with this kind of uh, philandering is, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there, there, there are a number of problems. It's, it's good to do strategically. There's a long history of using it as a survival tactic. But uh, I wouldn't put all your eggs in that that basket. You you you've got to do it out of convenience. But if you if you get trapped in it, then that's that's very bad. So so in other words, the problem is exactly what you've highlighted: is you start to believe your own malingering. So so they they so this is basic malingering 101. Um, so strategic <laughs> malingering has a very honored history. Of, you know, in ancient Greece, there's this guy. Who I mean, I mean a Greek hero, um, Achilles, right? He he philandered. He he pretended he he was nuts. He said like, I'm not going to go into this battle. Um, you guys are fucked up, and go and kill yourselves if you want. So what he did was he he feigned madness, and um, I can't remember what he did, but he plowed. He he would something about a plow in his field and he got caught out because I can't remember who the character was, but some, some smart ass um, went, um, uh, went to expose him as a fraud and he exposed him as a fraud in the legend by putting his baby in front of the plow and Hercules went round his baby. He didn't plow, plow the baby up. And he said, there you are, you see you malingering. And he went, oh shit. So he had to turn up at the battle of Troy. But there, there's also another story in, in ancient Greece um, where this guy, he, he was a famous uh, <laughs> so and, and coward. And so he would go into battle and, you know, drop his shield and run, which is despicable. You would be an outcast for most Greeks to do that and Spartans. But the but he did it time and time again, and he was such a card that he kind of made a cult out of personality cult out of it. He was a kind of celebrity because it, it wasn't that he wouldn't. He was completely cowardice. It's just he, he, he just didn't have the foibles of the other Greek. He didn't have the moral, you know, absolutism of like faulty. And so he just said like, fuck, why not drop my, my shield and run? I, it's cheap to buy a new shield. <laughs> compared to losing your <laughs> life. And, the, and that was, it was like so honest and forthright. The Greeks didn't know what to do with him. But the, but yeah, um, the, the problem is just, you got to know what you're doing. Right? And so, so in other words, uh, if, if you get a note of, you know, you get uh, excused from PE class or swimming class from the teacher, uh, that's, all very well, as long as you don't start to believe your own um, your own malingering. Uh, so, the the key thing is to to get a note from teacher to get out of the the labor camp, um, and not waste a single moment. Use that time to prepare the end of the labor camp and an escape route out of it. So, so you know you don't want to go. Oh, I've got toothache, and then go and 
sit in your bed. As soon as everybody turns their back, out of your bed and use that fucking time to dig <laughs> like a demon. <laughs> so, so yeah, that that's uh, that's what that's what I'd say about that. Is is yeah, I mean, I mean, malingering is an art. There's the Greeks are are experts at it. I mean, I often like wondered the, um, the, 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 in the, looking at. Well, well, I mean, there's there's an underground now. They're driving an underground economy. They're driving mm. pe people to, you know, Greeks were always a bit ready. You know, they've had 400 years under the Turks. They know how to get around bureaucracy. But as the state now has muscled people down more and more, is they finding more and more creative ways of getting around it. So, yeah, there's a there's a black economy. Uh, there's black market here in um, fake jab certificates and stuff it's like what yeah. did you expect um, so, no I, when you, I was originally looking at when I was originally looking at this uh, I actually did it in reverse was every time I came across somebody who was creative and who uh, the first thing that would struck, strike me was that the, they couldn't have done it unless their life had given them some kind of advantage in time or finances or help from other people and uh, and, and, you know, so you would work from the, the sort of flashing neon light, which was a creative thing that they'd done, and then work back to their biography. Uh, and you would almost invariably find this, this, this cluster of facilitation that came about through, you know, some kind of excuse, some kind of uh, um, windfall of money or something like that. Uh, and, of course... Those people had to be worthy of it in a way because uh, they, they needed their own. They, they couldn't have done it without some personal qualities that they they had anyway. But um, I think I often wondered because there was just so much of it, and I wondered whether any of those people realised what what uh, their position was and whether they how much they owed it to not being part of the ordinary system because it just never seems to have been acknowledged. Um, you, you know, no, that didn't no, seem to be... They, they, knew, they know. People like Dali and um, Picasso and Banksy and stuff, they know exactly what they're doing. They, 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 it's, you see, they have a very keen sense that they're in a mental asylum. And the mainstream people that we call sane in Upside Down world are absolutely fucking mad. And they know that very keenly, and they have no intention of participating in the madness for more than two seconds. So, yeah, they, they I mean, Dali would feign sickness at <laughs> every turn uh, just, just, for, uh, just to basically get out of the labor camp. But the, you see, those, those guys, they, they were talented enough. They, you know, it's the way of the artist. So the artist and the trickster figure are, are the same. The way the, um, uh, the it's the, the fox, they played the fox all the time uh, and they knew what they were doing, <laughs> they knew very well. But they, they, luckily they were talented enough that they, and, and then socially talented enough too, to, to manage the art market and then uh, earn their freedom, or not their freedom, but a special place in the, in the insane asylum um, by virtue of the fact that they, they could sell the, the art for, for a lot of money. Um, but they all knew what they were doing, and, and they played a little game of who, who can risk saying it. So, you know, the, the Dardoists and, you know, the, the urinal that was put on, you know, put on uh, an exhibition. You know, the urinal? I can't remember what his name was. Uh, that, that whole school of uh, conveniences, what, what was his name? Oh, Gary, you're muted, yeah. Sorry, I think it starts with D. I just can't get it now. Uh, does that give you a clue? I just can't think yeah, of it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not data, uh, but anyway. It's, anyway the, no, the uh, artist, yeah, anyway. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the, the, there's, there's, you know, there's a tradition of, of how, how much of the game people can reveal. But, yeah, and the, the idea of actually, you know, whinging out of of work uh, to do art is, is, I agree, it's like kind of part of all artists. You, you kind of, you, you, 
you're in a in a cleft stick. You either have to do fascist art and stuff that's utilitarian, decorative for the for the the ideologues and the the you know basically you have to do decorate the prison kind of art, um, conforming, or otherwise you can do rebellious art. In which case, you better be talented because you you're going to make money out of pennies. Anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely in that camp. <laughs> Trying to. Uh, not... oh, well, this is the thing because you, you can see this even on, um, uh, you know, if you go and look at you, some of these YouTube channels of people who have got uh, put a lot of work into them and all the rest of it. And they uh, generally don't reveal anything about their personal lives. But after a little while, you pick up a little clue here and a little clue there and realize that they just aren't some ordinary person who works the, the you know the checkout counter every day or, or you know is, is is in an office every day they, they they didn't have some difference some kind of facilitation uh they wouldn't be able to do that um yeah well well i mean this is all done as um freud was very keen on this subject and he wrote about this in civilization and its discontents and mm -hmm. the, also that they had what they called the problem of the artist like otto rank and those guys went into all of that mm -hmm. but the 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 idea of the the artist trying to um a get out of uh, labor and you know because it's cut insane and um and b try and signal to other people to, to get out is um, is the real art. Real art is not done with a paintbrush on a canvas. It's done by communicating um, under the wire to hmm. to the others. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it's difficult because you can you can sell your soul. You can be a Joe Rogan and be a, a centralist, and then in other words, you you're doing you know Auschwitz radio, and you can you know, follow within the, the guidelines and, and stuff like that. But the, um, yeah, it's, um, uh, you know, that way you can be fed and get lots of money. Uh, but if you, if you want your integrity and you want to be a rebel, then there's no money in it. So it, no, there's no market for the truth. You see. So this is, this is the, the problem of the artist is the artist is trying to tell the truth, particularly from the four, the uh, four other brainers. It's trying to tell the, the truth to the alien cortex, which fundamentally is a liar and lives on lies. It feeds on lies. It is. It's. It. It uh, only exists because of lies. So, so, uh, in, in the face of that, to tell the truth to power, in other words, for the four brain layers to tell the truth to the, to the alien cortex, um, they 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 have to try, you know be on a on a high wire and it's basically um, you know it's a minefield. But the, the, you know, if uh, if you don't, if you tell the truth, there's no market for it because the alien cortex doesn't want the truth; it wants lies. So you have to add a little bit of a lie into the art, and you know that's the art is decorating it with enough lies um, so that you can get past the alien cortex. And, and successful people can can make money and tell the truth. But you see, this is the problem that. That I'm, I'm saying where I started this conversation with, with it's to tell the people that the the flipping is uh, is virtually impossible because you know in the old days the artist would be subtle and communicate you know subtly but now you, you can put up a banner and uh, you know shout on the loud hailer and stuff and people people there's no subtlety left. In the internet age, there's no subtlety left, and so, so you you can't you can't dog whistle and speak under the wire or anything to to the prisoners in the camp. It's just they they'll pick you you know the camp guards will pick you out in a second if you if you tell the truth, and and all the prisoners are inoculated against any mavericks. So so you know they they it's the problem of the artist now is more difficult than ever. Um, this is uh, goes back to um, what Petra. Um, uh, I don't know if you had a chance to listen to to the talk uh, Petra was saying about um, Michael Lunig, the uh, cartoonist who was cancelled in Australia a little while ago for being a little bit too blunt. You know, um, 
but actually, I was actually thinking of, uh, I don't know what this fellow's name was. It was Frida Kahlo's husband. Um, uh, I think, like, uh, I don't know when it was, you know, uh, back in the 1930s or something, he was commissioned to do a mural for, for some car company, uh, General Motors or something. And he did this very uh, communistic workers, um, power to the workers kind of thing, you know. <laughs> I, I get the, I, I can't remember the story in detail, but I think he, 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 it was completed. And then they finally realized that he was having a joke at, at their expense and booted him out, you know. Uh, but it was this grand, this grand um, thing painted in the factory. Um, <laughs> You, they all do it, uh, like Gustav Klimt yeah. did it in the mm. um, in uh, in a ceiling, I think, called called philosophy. So for the philosophy department, in a, oh in a yeah, you, he, uh, he, he, he yeah. basically he did as much as you could say in a picture is is you know philosophy and medicine is bullshit, <laughs> and they they were onto him, yeah. they caught him, and then they were like, damn, we paid yeah. you, you know. We paid you a lot of money to do this, and you just took the piss. And then a lot of people, you know, said, "But that's that is good philosophy." And so, so it, he, although they caught him, I don't think they painted it over. <laughs> but man, the philosophers were angry. <laughs> I think they still. Yeah, angry. I think you you posted that once quite a long time ago. I remember that. Yeah. Um, so what are we going to do now? It's well, two hours. Are you going to move on yeah. to the manifesto or? Or yeah, well, so it... it's uh, maybe maybe that was we we did the manifesto indirectly uh, in a lot of this, but anyway, I'm I'm carrying on writing it up so that so that mm. you know, have something for people to review. Um, but yeah, just in terms of the sigil and consecrating the sigil and stuff. So so uh, yeah, maybe I, I, well, I didn't communicate it very well, but what I was intending was that everybody does their own ceremony, so something that's completely personal and completely meaningful to them, and then uh, you don't tell me or anybody else, uh, or you can you know, maybe refer it to, to Lionel and get some advice because he's got good advice. I, I put a, the email out there from, from what Lionel said, which was very interesting. But in uh, yeah, and, and then on the solstice, on the 21st of December, do your little ceremony and then then so that it's not private uh, and we can all share in it and enjoy whatever you did, then the next day, just post a video. You don't have to post your face or anything just so we can enjoy. You don't have to go to much trouble, just just small as you like or big as you like, but uh, and then just, just post it so we can all share it. The point is that you can't really do this thing in a Zoom call. You want to do this kind of thing in person, but that's not available to us anymore. So, so we're doing an exploration of can you do a kind of ritual like this um, on your own and then share it afterwards? And that's that's what I'm hoping is because I'm experimenting with what you can do on the internet. And, and Thank you. you know, I, 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 yeah, I disagree with you there. I really, I think it could. I'm not. I'm not saying that I particularly want to do it that way, but uh, I think it could be done as a group. I don't think distance has got anything to do with the kind of energies you're dealing with. Um, it, I'll give you an example. Oh, really, really. Um, just just a, happened to me earlier this year where uh, I injured my back, and I uh, went to a lady who does. Uh, it's called bone therapy. It's it's just a very gentle thing. Um, it was about all I felt I could tolerate. Um, I basically went just because it was just not going to be an ordeal. Uh, and I'd, I'd only seen, I'd only been twice when the uh, lockdowns came and I couldn't go back again. And this lady seemed to be fairly, uh, uh, you know, like open-minded to me. So I rang her up and I said, hey, how about I just lie on my bed and you go over to the, table where I would have been if I'd seen you and you just when we just do it over the telephone and I would say uh, that the effect of that which we did it about another three times was actually stronger than being there in person in, in other words the su subtle energies are, are not interested in distance or physicality it's got nothing to do with it 
And it's just leading me down this path of, of, of wondering whether uh, doing this sigil um, thing could be done with us all together on a call uh, where we're simply connecting in with it and maybe Lionel is the kind of uh, um, whatever you want to call it. He's, he's guiding the thing and, 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 and uh, moving from one section to the other. And, and we're, we're all just focusing on, on connecting with each other and focusing into the sigil and letting Lionel lead it and guide the energies and, 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 uh, and work it that way. Um, you know, um, I mean, we could do that as yeah. well, you know. So, so I'm trying to do something more ambitious. So, so what I'm really riffing off something that I did in my cult when I was younger, uh, in the cult that I was in. Uh, so that, that was pre-internet. And so the important thing was we had people all over the world. You know? And so, so the important thing to, to do, we had these kind of, kind of things. And then what uh, the important thing is to get the exact same time so that everybody knows that everybody's doing the same thing at exactly the same minute. And so that's why it's post the time of the solstice. You must get the exact time right to the minute. So if you get the, the exact time and the exact thing, then it's very powerful. Everybody knows that around the world, everybody's doing, they know what everybody's doing. Um, then you get, I won't ruin it by spoilers but you by you know enough to say that you know that you get enough synchronicity and enough um, enough uh, things coming out of it strange things coming out of it that you can you can definitely see the power of it and I also th thought it was more powerful than actually being on a call so there's that and the there's also the thing that I'd like to see you know the internet's going to go away one day and I'd like to see what we can accomplish with without the crutch of actually being on a Zoom call. You see, so so uh, the, you see, you can communicate around the world pretty easily on the inter intersubjectivity synchronicity telephone. Uh, we using the internet for this, but uh, if you get, you know, if we get this a little more advanced, uh, yeah, you can. The, you, you without the digital crutch, it's more more powerful. So so this is our, our first attempt to just just see if it can grow. I think it's it's really nice to share it afterwards because that's something we couldn't do back in the day, and so we would compare notes afterwards, and that was an important part of you know it's not retro causality or anything, but but that that was part of of the the effect. So. There, there definitely has to be a retrospective afterwards, but it seems so cool because a lot of people want to remain anonymous. I think that's a good thing. It's not necessarily you show your face on this. And there are a lot of um, lurkers. And, uh, yeah, I, I think another is, thing is... Um, share. You know, basically it gives the, yeah. the lurkers some, some, some time to... I mean, gives them an opportunity to participate and share without showing their face, which is also something we couldn't do back in the day. Um, I think the other thing there too is uh, um, a, a lot of people who do that kind of thing, they, they're, they're probably very accustomed to doing it alone um, and uh, just kind of scatter their energies trying to do it if they have to sit there and set, a, set the camera up in front of them or something like that, you know. It, it would be distracting. So, uh, I mean, you know, it's going to vary with the individual. Some people can maintain their... Their focus it wouldn't worry them, and, and others would kind of just be well, distracted. Well, that's the kind of experiment. Is that is what mm. what can we do in terms of digital things? You know, it's like mm. it, you see that it's it's a very you see you see it's very powerful if if um, if we can get it to work. Mm. <clears throat> you see, uh, you have to imagine things like they're going to use the, the internet strategically. So they, the you know, it's the internet is military technology. It was developed by DARPA. It's just like the highway system. They let you use it as a civilian, just as a courtesy. So you, you know, um, in peacetime. But our use of the internet now is a peacetime courtesy on wartime technology. 
So it, the same as the highway system. If you go back to Eisenhower and have a look, they, they weren't really even coy about it. They actually said that it was, you know, um, you know, done for the civilian population to get around, but it's really so that the military can get from, uh, for security reasons, can get from one side of the states to the other. The internet's yeah. the same. And so, so basically, you, you are, are allowed to use it in peacetime. But it's, you know, already it's being shaped horrendously. It's been balkanized. And, and you, you can see as, as soon as every tin pot dictatorship now, as soon as there's trouble, they, they shut down social media, they shut down the internet and stuff. It's becoming routine. And, and liberal democracy has gone the way of the horse and cart. So the, you, we're already seeing, you know, the first signs of, you know, cancellation, censorship, shaping, intrusion, surveillance, and, and also impersonation. Right? That's, that's getting kind of big. But, yeah, but the time, yeah. the time you're on, you know, they'll use it for propaganda and deep fakes. And, and then when, when the shit hits the fan, uh, you know, that you can see them under-reporting all the, all the riots and, you know, the opposition that you're seeing around the world is completely under-reporting it. And so, you know, at, at some stage, Stage, they're going to switch the internet off strategically now and again. They're going to use the DNS service to re redirect people. Um, so, so we're seeing the twilight of a free internet, and as free as it ever was. But the, we should hone our skills a little bit for the new world where we, where we don't have to rely on it, or uh, you can rely on it intermittently to, you know, and then know that we have other avenues that are outside the internet to, to actually communicate. Yeah, I think it's a matter of getting tuned into that. Uh, um, I mean, maybe that's something that we, we actually need to focus time on to become accustomed to using the, the internet of the, of the uh, you know, the intersubjectivity internet, if you like, um, to to be able to to use that more, with more awareness and more more certainty, um, instead of just experiencing it as an occasional synchronicity and thinking, oh, that's interesting, let's start start to be tuned in enough that that you, um, you you're confident that that somebody else has picked up on what on, on what you've just been running through your brain no it's automatic there's no doubt there so so as, you see as the yeah but i think there's a, a it's a problem of people's confidence and and really their their whether they're really with it you know or whether they just think it's a uh, curiosity uh no no they, they no i don't think that's an issue because they they uh they wouldn't even notice it because as as the egregore develops and people's uh thinking gets aligned uh, you can see the touch, just just anything. So, so it's like the it happened with like the hobos in any subculture. The ho the hobos started. There's a whole lexicon of glyphs symbols, and yeah. Marcus yeah. symbols that the, the hobos used, and it's like yeah. all developed. The hobos never went like you know had, they never sat down and said, "Can we make a system that does this that." explains you know all this complicated symbology it's like it just developed it's, it's not like magic you put a little symbol on a post and they go aha and everybody knew it it just spread like and it, it works the same way with this is that eventually people get that you get the signatures aha only an extinction Adi member would do that and uh, so yeah, you know that um, it's, uh, it's uh, automatically uh, identifiable and it's it's oh. actually on the stage because you know, for for a guy oh, yes. to actually get there, they have to be so dyed in the wool in in mm. in the subculture that they are essentially mm. of it anyway. Mm. You don't think that the time we're living, you, you see, if you go back uh, to to that, for instance, that hobo culture that you're talking about, um, my feeling, I guess, my only comment there is i think you were talking about what was psychically a vastly less cluttered place uh, i mean I, I think the kind of world we're living in now is 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 like a the, the equivalent of being stuck in a fucking screaming football stadium somewhere in terms of um the, the, the amount of trash and clutter and and general pollution of psychic space of every space for that matter um 
Uh, well, this is this is this is very important. Okay, so so yeah, this keeps me up at night. And this, in a sense, in essence, in when I say in 2018, where I realized that, you know, I got on social media and realized these people are not savable, is that is the signal to noise ratio is just fucking extreme. The noise mm -hmm. out there is almost impossible. The psychic noise. See, that's why I kind of came down a little bit. Sorry, Sophie, mm -hmm. on discussing with Petra <laughs> about sociology. That's the noise. That's the kind of bullshit noise that sounds like it's interesting and stuff, but it's noise. Mm -hmm. It's like there's no upside to talking psychology and to about a psychologist and what do you think? It's like they all they're just gonna add to the noise and degrade the signal. There's nothing that psychology can offer us anymore. It's done. Psychology is science, you can pick over the bones, but psychology is done as a discipline. Yeah, it'll work a bit as therapy, but Anybody knows how to do mutual therapy, therapy and support. I mean, they're doing it on the Collapse Reddit, and we must definitely support each other mutually. But as a professional, it's not open as an avenue. You'll lose your license doing that kind of shit. It's basically, it's subversive. So, you know, a psychologist is, like, unfortunate. But, but anyway, that's the, the thing is that this noise is so, so loud. Now, if you go back and see in the, the videos that I did, particularly about the Paul Shannon, the ones about the Darwin things, about, I think, in the way to see evolution and the, the processes of evolution are, are far more to do with signal. If you look at animals and you spend any time looking at the fish and the seagulls like I do, uh, you try and figure out what the fuck they're doing when they're talking to each other and stuff. Look at seagulls in particular. Um, they generally say you can after a while you can see what they're doing a hell of a lot of communicating a hell of a lot of noise the vast majority of it the vast majority of the thing is what a seagull is 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 saying is like you know get off my patch get off my patch <laughs> it's like this is mine fuck off and then the you know the other bird passing by will go ah shut up <laughs> but that's what they will do they're just saying get out of my yard is it and and the, you can see them, you, know, you can see pairs of them. They have a little nest or a little bit of territory. And the, they'll switch. One comes comes down, they'll switch. And then they'll also they'll be like, get off my patch, get off my patch to any, any other bird that comes close. But it, and you can see them all doing that. And the fish and stuff, you can also see that they do a signal that way. But the vast majority of, of this thing is signaling. And the signaling is either to disperse or, or aggregate things. So it's either diffusion or or clustering and that, that's the the primary process that's going on but it's uh, it, you know you don't get down to tooth and claw darwin it's not as gross as darwin thought the, the vast majority of things is done through signaling there's sexual things from mates and that they're all done for these vast amounts of communication going on in the animal kingdom Virtually so what, what you're saying is that we we've, we've got this actually built in we just have to to uh kind of rediscover it for ourselves well it's, it's more than just built in it goes down into the fabric of the prima mater mm. so mm. this so the so yeah in that thing I, I i give you some hints about how to get signal through the noise and so it's a kind of a dance it's basically it, it's the reason why uh, you get you know sexual organs become more and more complex over time it's so if you have an attractor like say the female is the attractor then the males can find the female with mutual signaling, right? So the female acts as a cluster point or focal point of attraction. Now, as in the number of males increases, so if if I get, it's the same thing I was talking about with AI. So if I go, da, 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 you can complete that. So if you, you, you know that I, the next thing that comes in that sequence is da, 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 da. So if mm. I do da 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 as a prompt and you do da da, then we mm. automatically know, okay, we've got the same algorithm. Right? Now, mm. if other people get that algorithm, it gets noisy again. They come with their bullshit. <laughs> and other people do an imitation of that. So if the, the original bird uh, then wants to, has to develop the signal, a bit like dueling, dueling banjos, it has to be uh, some kind of innovation on the theme. And then, you know, the attractor can now say, pick that out and reinforce that. But they're in this kind of, uh, the dog whistle, so the writer is doing it with dog whistles and stuff. Yeah, and, and with, um, you know, um, the uh, Let's Go Brandon stuff. Um, it, it's, uh, they, they sing, 
Oh, so if you don't remember the, the oh, so so there you see this thing is the wing has these memes, but the the so so let's go. Brandon is like a code for fuck Joe Biden, um, but you see the the right got into it through through NASCAR and stuff that is only right wing, and then they used it far and wide because all the left wing liberals didn't know what they were saying until you know it took a while, a while before the left wing catches up and then knows that left you know. Let's go, Brandon is code for fuck Joe Biden. And then when they've got when they've cracked the signal, then of course the signal's polluted and pilots on Southwest are getting fired for saying let's go Brandon and stuff. And the you know, but that you see, but you can always then have a, a derivation on let's go Brandon with you know one step ahead of the, the left, and they have to catch up again. So in the meantime, you're strengthening this core group that now knows this richer and richer language of communication. So as it gets more complex, it gets harder to penetrate. You can't recruit so easily um, in, into the into the egregore, but uh, the, the egregore is getting tighter and tighter based on this kind of communication. So so what I'm doing with this is the first thing in da 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 da. da. So we'll give a little try with the sigil and see how it goes, and then um, you know learn from it. And it, because you you also want to new, use new media, so you know the digital thing and stuff is new media for us to do it. We don't want to rely on it, but we want to be able to, to use it. Um, to, so I hope that makes sense, but uh, we, we evolve our, our own egregore and mindset exactly the way evolution do, um, does a speciation of it. God, you learn a lot on this. <laughs> oh, no, it's a very interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah, it, because I was kind of just stuck. I didn't have an alternative way of looking at it, of thinking about it, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, well, it's interesting, yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, oh, I think there's, I think we're already uh, sort of get connected up, you know. Um, I was thinking... Uh, just just like um last week i think was it um when um joe and i were going to have a telephone conversation and uh uh it was sort of you know within a few seconds of me having thought about that there will be a text message show up you know uh it, it, and you think to yourself and, and it just it didn't happen once i think it happened two or three times enough to be quite certain that there was more going on and just what meets the eye, you know, um, and and you know you get those uh, intimations of connections already forming, which is very interesting. Yeah, there is the phenomenon. So, so Rupert Sheldrake and that is not completely up the garden path with mm -hmm. stuff, you know. Like, I look back to see if you look back to see if you look back to see if you were looking at me. <laughs> uh, that that kind of thing is, uh, yeah, it's. Um, People, there, there is a telepathy out there. So, the, I mean, you're never going to convince Michael Shermer of it, but the reason is, you know, a lot of this stuff has to do with, you know, <laughs> it's a catch-22. It, it has to do with how much you believe and how much you're open to. So, so Michael Shermer, it will never, uh, Rand, you know, Randy, whatever his name is, uh, you know, debunk this... Um, spiritualists and stuff like that uh, those guys are correct in their world it does not exist and it cannot exist but they never get the, get the obvious that is is they it doesn't and although they told it often is that it doesn't exist because the cop in them is precluding them from from it so they, they will never get in the circles or be exposed to the information or experiences that allow them to do it because they're closed-minded if they opened up their mind a little bit, they would soon get into territory where they went, what the fuck? How did that happen? And all their little rationalizations and, you know, all the little statistical analysis and stuff would break down. And then, then they onto something. But they can't get there because they actively avoid it. They will actively avoid those situations. And if they see something that goes co totally contrary to their rationalism, they they will the cop will immediately step in, and 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 basically they they will run, <laughs> in effect. So those people are not. It's not. So you have to open up your mind enough to to then 
do this. And when you do, then uh, the opposite problem is you get gaslit. See, people people don't, might not realize how comfortable they are in their rationalism. When their rationalism gets broken by a, an incident or two, <laughs> and they can be doozies, I mean, scary as fuck. So when that happens, then they panic and they run. And then, then Lord Hughes, the most evil person on the world. <laughs> so, so open-minded person, people go that way. But the... Uh, um, yeah, the rationalists uh, are too frozen. Uh, the, the other guys are too chicken. Uh, but somewhere between... I, them, I think that the rationalists, uh, in a way, the rationalists are kind of experientially impoverished. If they if they just had a little bit of um, something like that appear in their lives, it would move them quite a bit. Well, you see, what, what's, what you should expect to happen in the kind of, you know, as we head towards collapse and the flippening uh, the, uh, what you should see happen is more and more subgroups, sects and cults and that will discover this on their own. And so it from the Michael Shermer point of view, it looks like the world's going crazy. So you see more and more groups that look like conspiracy theorists, QAnon, guys that are just batshit crazy. And they, they will write, you know, Shermans will write long laments about the end of the Enlightenment and end of rationalism and, the, you know, all the violins will be playing. But you see, more and more people will discover irrationalism on their own and the fact that it can communicate. Now, here's the thing. It's, it gets amplified exponentially with the number of people involved. That's one of the reasons why I think we should start you know, evangelizing and getting more exposure for, for the flipping and the sigil and the extinctionality is because it's as you see, you can, if good practitioners of this can use people, especially open-minded people, they, they can use their telepathy to, to enhance an effect. So in other words, you get somebody that's open-minded to the whole concept and not too rational. And then you can you can prime them, and then and then show them something that something that, that you as the practitioner couldn't actually do, you know, like Jedi mind tricks, that you couldn't actually do on your own. But you you can you can yoke them by priming them and leading them in and saying, you know, this is what I'm going to show you, and then and then you can show them something which you couldn't do on your own. So in other words, you can so a practitioner could harness other people's psychic energy, sorry to say the new age expression. But but you see, people will find that on their own. As these cult leaders and guys, different egregore sects and cults start, you know, end time apocalyptic cults start, John Bandel comes to mind, all of these people, they will on independently start to find all of this stuff and start to, to find their power. So not only will the world fragment, but the, those groups will become more powerful and, and more, more of a shock to the rationalists. So, anyway, I'll leave you with that. Yeah. Uh, it's more. Um, uh, uh, it, uh, it might be better to describe it as is more like um, uh, what would be the term? Not not irrational. Well, they'll but, call but it like a collective illusion. They'll call it a collective illusion, and and uh, you see they, they grow. No, no, I, I just they, mean I'm just mean distinguishing with the rational world, but not not by being irrational, but being uh, in a way hyper or or beyond rationality. You're still using it, but but you you're also gone beyond it at the same time. You you haven't just become totally irrational. You, you're simply entertaining what rationality has traditionally excluded. Yeah, you must never lose rationality. Mm. Um, but see, what what's permitted within rationality is is infinite, and uh, Michael Shermer's think it's finite and closed. So the I, idea, you see, every time somebody like Gil Cantor or something, um, you know, or uh, Girdle or one of these guys sh demonstrates using the tools of rationality, the the, the <coughs> limited, unlimited nature of rationality mm. or conversely its inconsistency or incompleteness the, the 
then um, all the rationalists lose their minds. Oh, unfortunately, mm. they don't lose their minds. <laughs> they try and hang on to their minds. But they, they lose their shit because uh, they want the, the world to be closed, predictable, finite, controllable. And, and if, you, if you go far enough down the path of rationality, you get to quantum theory and girdle incompleteness and, you, and Cantor's infinities and improve. You know, using the rational methods that were supposed to be the instruments of control, you prove that everything is uncontrollable. Mm. Um, and, I, and so, yeah, they, they, they're heading for a bruising. All the rationalists are heading for a bruising. And now is the time of the bruising. You know, the, the apocalypse is the big bruising. It's the revelation. So I, I'm, I'm going to have to uh, disagree a little bit there. I, I think that, you know, for the, for the rationalists that are properly scientifically minded, um, their certainty is, is what's anathema to them. So if there's, if there's anything that is, uh, you know, like, like part of the reason why it's okay for a scientific rationalist to have uh, Girdle and these things uh, just smash the, the foundations is because ultimately those foundations were based on faith that the that r rationalization would be a total thing that would cover the entire universe and every everything that could it could touch and it's it's clearly that's not that that's not the case due to these geniuses that broke through that wall however you know that's not a surprise it's about humility in the face of truth and where i am very scared of is uh, we're talking a lot about things where there's there's we're reintroducing faith once rationality dies, where, where we're talking about, okay, we have telepathy now, and we have these superpowers that, you know, just because rationality breaks down does not imply, you know, that there's a, there's evidence for, um, for, for things for faith, like you, you should, you should be open minded, but not never certain and never like, hopeful that things are going to come the way that you want them to. And I, I think that's where I'm like, I'm feeling uncomfortable in these discussions is that we're starting to admit things that we don't have evidence for and that we um, that that are like comfortable or comforting and and uh, in in the face of what might be just true like I'm okay with the reality being incredibly broken right but I don't want to try to fix it by pretending yeah, though that's why I say you should never let go of rationality. So if if you feel that it needs empirical um, truth and evidence and demonstration, then then yeah, we must pursue that and and make sure that we have that. In if you know, uh, yeah, I hope we're not getting to the point where we're deluding ourselves. So you must. You must stay on solid, solid ground, um, and yeah, if if that's a danger, you see, the the what what these guys are really trying to do is they they want completeness. They they want to be able to close the book. They are really seeking their own death, and so they they don't want science to be infinite. They they want it to be you know a theory of everything and a nice equation that explains everything and stuff. And they, so they they want to close. Uh, the the book on inquiry and the book on the book on life. You can't if you go down this route. You you can't go very far where you just get subjective evidence. So all evidence is really subjective. But if you see, if you do That's some of this rude stuff and you get something you can't explain, it's it's. I know Ryan, you're resistant to acid trips and stuff like that, and that's a good thing because I saw somebody talking about psilocybin and stuff on the. Thing is, don't don't take the drugs. They'll hold you back, but you will get the effects naturally if you pursue this long enough and hard enough. You will get the effects. Now you've got a problem there, because you know something that's absolutely you've seen with your own eyes. It's more real than anything somebody could show you on the on the lab bench. So, but you're stuck now. You can't go back and you know confer with the with the collective and say the subjective truth. How does it? fit in the collective truth and says it has no place you say but i know it's more true than even you so in other words it's like i'm dreaming you and all your evidence in a dream i woke up and saw what the truth is what do I, do I mean that? 
first of all, all our, our, all our evidence is not permitted. And and the the other thing is, you 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 can't catch this beast by the tail. You can't have have your cake and eat it. At some stage, you have to let go, because the the evidence itself will always be subjective. You will never be able to to mm. be absolutely certain that you didn't dream your result. So the that and the important thing is that what uh, a, a big kind of conceit of of these guys that think that they open minded and of the enlightenment ideal and my dad was always one of these guys who they think you know you must always be open minded and you know thought of everything as infinite and kind of a good good liberal academic but the the problem about that is they refuse their axioms so all all of these things are axiomatic and they start you know this whole edifice that they build the entire idea of science that we have uh, and mathematics for that matter is built on axioms now the axioms are the price of entry into this world but then they refuse the axioms or forget them so our whole science is based on you know the cosmological constant it's like roughly 1 over 137 but now if you look at everything and everything say what is an atom what is this and that what is an electron he says they're all described in terms of other things in terms of other standard constants so you know you take you go on wikipedia you'll see you'll go on a little circle if you try and explain what is a tachyon and it's always explained in in terms of some other other scalar quantities or in in terms of other measurement and and so when you finally get back to it it's all closed and hangs in there it's all just circular so we don't actually know anything other than the self referential circle that hangs in the air and then where it gets grounded to say well what's the re absolute relationship of all these things and it turns out to be you know this just constant 1 over 137 so everybody says well, well why is it 1 over 137 as as if it's going to you know as if they can leap outside their closed hermeneutic circle with this bit of information and you say you can't that 137 is where you get to when you make this closed so it started on the axiom of baconian kind of empiricism well that, so, that brings so to mind the end of baconian empiricism and you're looking over the edge of the cliff into no man's land and you say like you saying well we're on the edge of a continent looking into no man's land saying no you've forgotten look behind you you're on an island. But that's what brings to mind what uh, somebody, I think it's you that posted the last interview of Ian McGilchrist on his last book, The Matter of Things. And at some stage in the interview, um, he, he comes to this point about uh, scientific rationality and experiments and, and, uh, and, and, and looking at results and then drawing conclusions uh, from different experiments. And he says it's at that stage that the instinct comes in, but there is at one stage you pick, you pick something based on your instinct. At the end, the biggest discoveries, the biggest experiments, had to be concluded by a choice that was coming from your instinct. I don't know if you listen to that, but it's a, it, it makes me think of what you say. You you can't exclude that from rationality. It's impossible. I, I think that's true in general with high-level mathematics and physics is that the papers that get published um, are often like translating the initial insights from from the instinct or the the uh, you know imagination that you know people are imagining four-dimensional things spinning in their head or whatever and that's not in the paper right but that's where the actual insights come from and it's merely just a, a way of communicating your insights to the rest of people in a way that they um, uh, that they've required for your career um, and it's it's a difficult thing to communicate um, and I think that you know th that intuition and insight um, it's it's easy to fool ourselves and think it comes from a divine place uh, like from from a, from a deity or from an outside force when really it, it does come from our minds we are social animals. We 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 can interpret, um, you know, the the feelings of our dead ancestors and things like that because we knew them and they're a part of us. And like the like the, you you don't have to cross over into a um, a dualistic world to get those kinds of effects. Um, it, it's just that our alien cortex thinks that we uh, it's total and understands everything. And if if there's a source of thought 
that doesn't come from it, then it determines that that's a, some kind of a supernatural thing. But that's just not true. It, our brain is much larger than our alien cortex gives it credit. Yeah, so our, our brain is actually the universe. So, so we, we, the lie of the alien cortex is it's a fragment of the universe that claims to be a whole. So, so the duality is wrong. There's no God out there. The God is our mind. The God you're looking for is your own mind. And your own mind is not between your left and right ear. It's in the world you're walking around in. So when you walk down the street, you're, you're, you know, that's that virtual reality, the machine that's creating the virtual reality of you walking down the street is your own mind. Now, as soon as you say that, everybody says, my brain is 70 billion neurons, and it's not creating the experience so there is some feet going down the pavement and saying no there isn't your brain is not that 70 billion neurons it's the street and the feet another way of saying it is is um you know like the large hadron collider the guys are saying all these fucking fakes in the large hadron collider they they, they you know come up with all the particles and then they find the higgs but <laughs> that's all a bit of a joke but you you know, to, to punch through it, you have to say, like, you say, it's in the detector, stupid. It's like you're saying, like, what did you discover? Say, oh, we found this little tacky and it did this little track and had this kind of energy and stuff. And say, what did you detect it with? And they never describe the detector. And you say, if you look at the detector, that'll describe the results. So, so they think that they're creating these particles with high energy and then they're detecting them and the thing. You say, no, it's the detection that's creating them, not the fucking acceleration and high um, energy particles. Of part, the, you see, the reality comes into, I mean, they know it from quantum theory. The reality comes into the existence by the detection. It's the, it's the observer. In this case, the observer is the instruments in the Hadron Collider, all the large experiments that detect all these effects. It's, they are not unraveling the universe. They're basically detecting an aspect of it that's predetermined by the detector. Go and get another detector, you'll get a different result. And you go, go and get another interpreter, you'll get a different result. And if you don't believe me, you can do an empirical experiment. Go and feed them some crap data which came from some other source, like you know, some guy's welding torch or atmospheric noise or something, and you'll see that they'll be able to prove supersymmetry or find some fucking theory of everything out of it. But nobody does double blind tests because we stopped doing science. They don't do science with the Large Hadron Corrida, by the way. It's bullshit. They, nothing's falsifiable. They never do double-blind tests. They ne never expose. All the data that we spent 4 billion you know, euros on, it's like, they don't share that. They don't let you add it. You're not allowed to see it. Because as soon as people pick over their data, they'll show that it's all statistical clumping. It's all bullshit left and right. It's all a hoax. Here, is it? Is it perhaps more helpful to think of uh, the fact that that all we can know is our experience, and so in that sense, we're always going to be trapped in a subjective uh, realm, uh, and that what we've actually not done quite. with science. Oh, go on. Not, not, you... not quite. Not quite. Not quite. Go on, go on. Right. You can't. You can't leave behind rationality. You see, see that presupposes. No, no, I'm not, so, I'm not, I'm not saying that. And random, and you can't understand yeah, but it. But it's lawful. The rational. It's lawful. The rational. So, so it's lawful all the way down. So, so that's the thing that we can't get our head around in the in the Western world. If something is is lawful but unpredictable, we just cannot get our head around that. Um. No, but what I, I think what I was trying to say was that the, it it is the, like for instance with science, what we're doing is uh, doing this little trick where we externalize the experience, uh, and and so the science is got, is uh, considered to be this um, very objective, rational thing, because we put it outside of subject of of what. What we experience, we can't experience the. The only way we can know the science is by our experience. So the whole thing is our experience. Um, and given that that's the case, then you can 
manipulate science rationally or look at it, examine it rationally, I mean, um, but that also means that you can you can rationally use and deal with things that science currently excludes, um, such as what we were talking well, about. That, yeah, it's, it's a good, it's a good. Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, the tricky thing there is that the yourself is the easiest person to fool. Like it's it's so easy to fool ourselves, and it, and when you externalize. Um, your results, um, you know, with the scientific method, you're getting peer review or something like that. It has to be in a form like I discussed earlier, where it's interpretable by colleagues. Um, and there is a there's an inherent bias due to that that can you know shape the path of science. But um, it's a trade off because it there are so many ways that that we can fool ourselves that um, just relying on solipsism alone to, to, to say that, you know, whatever I experience is uh, ground truth is um, uh, like I've been I've been so wrong so many times about what I've experienced that um, that it's it's given me a humility now that, um, you know, I'm I'm not uh, uh, certain about you know what what's going on but the the same thing is um just because science does not uh, first of all a lot of the things that people claim science does not um reach into uh like some of the new age stuff science has reached into and disproven and it's like the where where you can do you know these double blind experiments and show that telepathy isn't happening for example and and uh so the only way that you retain those beliefs is if you make some excuses for why they have to be true, and then, then you're not being open-minded to what the truth is coming in with. It's you're you're trying to hang on through faith for what you want to be true instead. So this is what just a personal experience of mine is. I I was in in um, uh, earlier in my life I was really into like auras and past lives and and crystals and and meditation and and all these things, and I, I was right there with you, Hugh, saying that you know this experience, the subjective experience of like energy and uh, things, that is more real to me than this table. And I, I, I was you know certain of that, uh, and I had very deep emotional, like spiritual experiences, where I felt those chemicals in my head um, that that you you're saying don't take drugs for, um, and. But but in the path of doing those things, I, I became under the influence of some folks that, um, you know, would sneak in other um, other claims. And uh, I mean, those those claims themselves were dubious, but the the other claims were like that, you know, you um, you should uh, that your stomach acid is made of potassium, for example. And it's like eventually I realized that that's uh, that's just objectively false. And yet I couldn't detect it because I became so uh, suggestible. I became, I, I left behind my, um, my skepticism and became suggestible and became uh, easily influenced. And I think that's where, where I'm, I'm worried about is that that's a, that's a psychopath's dream right there is when you get suggestible people. And I don't want us to be those people. Yes. yes. So, so absolutely, yeah, one hundred percent. That you should never let go of your skepticism, and uh, never get into pseudoscience. And uh, I say often, you you should be your own guru. It's like the there's a problem for me, and <laughs> the more I say you should be you know, your own guru, people, you get the like a Brian effect where people say, only the true guru would say, <laughs> you know, take off the mantle and say, be your own guru. And you're like, oh, fuck. But, the, you know, so, so, but, uh, yeah, so my task is to remind everybody of what you just said, right? Now, the, the problem is about the subjective thing is like the pseudoscience and paranormal uh, psychology in that they've set up a lot of experiments that, 
you know, they, they're mixing and matching in a way that's not legit in, in pseudoscience. And they look at the paranormal experiences um, and then they try and use statistics and stuff and to, to show that. So there, there's bullshit out there. There's a lot of the stuff about paranormal stuff is bullshit and you're, you're right to, to avoid it. The, the, but the, you know, it's not absolute. You, you see, it's very easy at that point to go too far because there is some real shit that, <laughs> that you will immediately, uh, Michael, show me your way out of being able to see if, if you yeah. suddenly then throw the baby out with the bathwater. So For example, so plate tectonics. Plate tectonics was yeah. seen as absolutely insane uh, when it first came out. But, you know, with yeah. enough information, it made sense. Yeah, so, so the way it works in general is, is that if you take a broad subject like, okay, let's take plate, plate tectonics, is is it starts off being complete rubbish. It's like the flippening is going to get this treatment if it you know, becomes more widely known. Is it, it, you know, it, it, you know, it's the Gundy thing is like, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then the fucking earth flips. But the, in general, the way these things go is that uh, you, you get the, this kind of flood that of, well, you get, say, like the, plate tectonics, um, use that example, is first it's ridiculous, then everybody suddenly realizes that it's probably true, and then eventually they start measuring it, and then, you know, and then, so then it becomes established fact. Then you, you're onto the new conservance, conservancy there, and then it's not really open to some other things that, you know, like Hapgood, uh, Hapgood was things about why the crust deformed and stuff, because it moved over an ablate spheroid, you know, earth crust displacement and stuff was not right. But, but you see, what I'm trying to say is once you get to the new boundary of the established, then things fall apart. You see that in science in general, and, and then it's wrong to reject the woo-woo stuff because you, you get to a point where the irresistible force meets, meets um, the immovable object. And it's out of those, it's in the fine dependence between those that the next bit of truth is synthesized out of. So, or the next insight into truth. So another way of saying this is, imagine nobody's heard about Paris. Then Marco Polo comes back from Paris and says, there's a place called Paris. Everybody says, bullshit. Eventually, they send people to investigate and they say, no, there is a place called Paris. Eventually, it becomes established that, yeah, that Paris is a real thing. Now they start studying Paris and they send hundreds of agents to go and investigate Paris and report back. That's the golden age where people say, yeah, you know, more and more people find, you know, the Champs-Élysées and the Eiffel Tower and Montmartre and stuff. And they come back reporting it and, and it's reproducible. Other people go and investigate and they come back. And then that's the golden age where everybody deludes themselves that now we understand Paris. As you go and send more and more agents to delve deeper and deeper into the details of the Eiffel Tower, Montmartre, and all of these details of Paris, then their subjectivity comes back. They come back in more and more contradictory reports of exactly what the Eiffel Tower is, how you look at it eventually. Everything looks subjective and you get a crisis of reproducibility, which is exactly where science is today. So we've gone from the Baconian method to this, this golden age of apparent certainty and now nobody can re reproduce, as we get into the nitty gritty, nobody can re reproduce anybody else's results. And vast fields of science, from the Large Hadron Collider to pseudoscience like psychology. And the reason is because we're getting now into the fine details of a fractal system. So the, the fractal nature is starting to basically appear. And now subjective experience is very important. If you go into Montmartre, it depends on who you meet, who you ask, exactly what part of Paris you went to, you can have, you know, you have a limited human lifespan where you can go as an agent to Paris, wander around it, and then report back. It's going to be very different now. Although you agree on the general layout of Paris and that there is a Paris and stuff, what Paris is and the general details and stuff get, again, dissolved in this complexity of subjective experience. And that's where we are at. We are one of those turning points in the world. So I hope that clarifies a little bit about woo-woo. <laughs> Is well, I think it I think it does clarify, but um, but you so there's a, there's a point in um, in a transition between two different plateaus of of um, 
of uh, realization where you need to be temporarily inconsistent as you get to the new one, right? You're, you're doing a little upgrade of your thinking and you're gonna have some contradictions along the way. And that's okay, um, especially if they, they're creative contradictions that help you push, push your thinking deeper uh, into exploring them. However, uh, you, you don't just get to smuggle in the woo-woo stuff um, uh, because it, if it's, because uh, it, it has to hold to the same standards, at least in terms of falsifiability and, um, and uh, being able to be, um, uh, I guess, not, uh, like if it's already been disproven in many ways, like you don't get to hold on to it as a security blanket because it makes you comfortable, right? You have to you have to face reality, and um, that's where you can't smuggle. It, you, you can't look, be so open minded that your brain falls out, right? So so those those are the things that you. It's okay to explore. Like maybe there are microtubule things for quantum effects in in intel in consciousness or intelligence, like that we could figure out. Are there experiments that we could run that that could. Um, that could make us wrong about that. But if we just say, it doesn't matter what would make us wrong, we're gonna believe it. That's where we've lost our minds. That's where our brain fell out. Okay, now you gotta be cautious here because you can't be methodical and, and, and get the, get to the goal. So, so you can't, I understand your uh, need for, for some kind of guardrails and some kind of defense. And that's legit. The thing is that we're under the clock. We're under the gun. The human lifespan is only just so long, and you can only absorb too much, so much of what other people have done before you. So you can stand on the shoulders of giants, but the giants are crumbling. We're losing touch with the knowledge from from the past. So they can they can only serve you so much. We're not actually accumulating knowledge like people think like you know we're building knowledge on the internet or the library of Co congress that's not true the library of congress is becoming a big pool of entropy that's completely index in, in a, indexable and we can't even interpret what previous authors as far back as shakespeare we barely have 50 percent of the contrast uh, comprehension of them that we had say even 20 years ago so the so so we're losing information that, that people think has been nailed down. So it's more like a moving light or something go, moving along uh, in a train. It's more like a conversation than it is actually a, an accumulation of certainty. So you need to break the mold to move on. But you're absolutely right. You need to be ruthless in terms of of pursuing reality. What, what we're after is the truth, and um, absolutely no time for the truth. But God is, that, that will close off the truth. You see, the solipsistic thing about paranormal stuff is, if you test paranormal stuff, is you will exclude it and get the, the Michael Shermer result merely because you have prejudice and you want to see a result without knowing it. So you, you have to guard against your own God. Um, so the you know as as things uh, as things go, uh, it becomes um, a, a question of getting to this leap. Uh, you see, it's 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 kind of like Watson and Crick. So Watson and Crick made a, a leap of imagination to get to the structure of the DNA molecule. They were right, but in the in the background, you've got Rosalind Carter, who's super cautious. And now every, all the feminists whinge because they say, well, why did those guys got Nobel Prizes? Um, because they men and Rosalind Carter did all the hard work and was the proper scientist and doesn't get anything. Well, she's right not to get anything because she, she very likely would never have, got, have discovered the structure of DNA going down the methodical path she was going down. So you, you can accumulate evidence and evidence and evidence and evidence and never put it together. And that's largely what's happening in science today is, you know, there's uh, over 2 million papers are published. It's too much information for anybody to drink from that fire hose. There's nobody left to put it together. So you're making a big mistake saying you can be methodical and guard against all the woo-woo stuff. 
say, well, you've got to make a leap of faith too. You've got to do a snap judgment on woo-woo and, <laughs> and stuff that's real. And and uh, so so this is not an easy game at all. But it, I'm saying if you see the Ros Rosalind Carter way, the clock will run out on you. What What's going on is you, you're really trying to leap over your alien cortex and your alien cortex is limited view. It's a fragment of the universe of, of this. Kind of in a way, it's kind of a degraded fractal picture of, of or a holographic picture of a bigger hologram. And so for the, holo for the, the degraded holographic picture to see the bigger hologram it is a kind of a, a, a thing of kind of empathy and self-reference. So, you know, you, you can basically say that this degraded image of this infinite hologram, you can see it and know it. <laughs> and that's really what you want to get to. Now, in the meantime, the, the alien cortex, which is our small mirror, our little tube that we're looking at the universe through is desperately trying to not disappear. It's trying to hold itself together with, you know, self -re self referential, um, uh, basically self support. So it's, um, it's trying to prevent you in other words, reaching this point of enlightenment. And the biggest thing it has on its side is the clock. We, we only have a certain amount of time and energy. To come, to come to this epiphany. And so it does everything it can to run out the clock. And a lot of these things are strategies to run out the clock. The Bible is a strategy to run out the clock. Because if you get stuck in any one of these things, the woo-woo thing, the new age thing, the Bible thing, the belief thing, or the science thing, you will find that it's a quagmire. And you, you will end your career as, you know, you'll get your laurels maybe, you'll be like Higgs, and you'll die very happy with a bit of gold in your pocket, a medal. Um, but you won't have actually got the real prize, which is what they were after, and that's understanding. So what time after time, these guys, especially the great ones, they, they fall short of the mark. And you can actually see in their careers where they do it. You can see as far as they got. And in essence, they, they kind of then reach their peak, and they sell out and take the gold and stuff and just just say that's that's as far up the peak that I got. But very few people will shut the fuck up and and not take any of the gold and not be distracted and push on to the peak. Those are very very few. Isn't it also fair to say that uh, even at the beginning of a lot of scientific enterprise, you begin with the woo woo because. Uh, you're you're imagining maybe some situation, and then trying to demonstrate that that might be so. You know that legend of uh, Einstein imagining that he was. What would it be like if I was riding on a on a beam of light? Uh, if you know, and if that's what actually happened, if that's what he did, um, imagine, then you can see he's just starting from a place of his own subjective ramblings you know he's not starting from any hard place hard rational place um and then of course he's invoking his scientific and mathematical apparatus after that but his beginning point was not a uh objective um verifiable concrete thing in, uh, yeah. originally so, so I think Einstein, Einstein was a fraud. He, Einstein was a front for, I can't remember her name, but it's, it's basically. I'm just using that as an example. I, I, you know, I don't know. I'm just saying, but as yeah. as an example, a beginning with beginning yeah, with. No, uh, no, it, uh, it is. Yeah, it it is. Yeah, you you kind of right, but I, Einstein was just channeling this way better physicist, and I can't remember her name, but she. She eventually went to Russia and I think died in a pogrom. But Einstein never did anything after he, he cut off his relationship with her. So she was clearly the source of all the shit he came up with. But the, uh, but the, um, the thing is, so she's kind of like the, the element of, of chaos, that uh, without that element of chaos, um, uh, Einstein was just too much of a plodder and too close-minded to do, to do any more contributions. So the, the thing, what you're talking about there and the woo-woo stuff is, you know, see it as uh, the, the devil is often, 
credited with having two magic powers. You know, the, the two magic powers are the power of dissolution and coagulation. So the so so the woo-woo stuff is is a very good tool. It's a power, a kind of acid of um, of dissociation. So it's basically a, it it can stop all the rigid thinking. It's kind of like LSD that can get people out of a rut, so, and including science and scientists. But um, and and people like Einstein. So Einstein had his LSD and this other woman, uh, which damn it, I would say, she's called Sabine. I can't remember. Um, that or Sabina. But anyway, I can't, damn, I wish I could remember. Um, anyway, she uh, she was the the dissolving acid that was the chaos that uh, you know worked well with with Einstein's coagulation impetus. So the two of them achieved a lot, and you will because they're doing, you know, I mean, does it run to extinctionati, and they're on the razor's edge. So somewhere on the razor's edge between, you know, dissolving all these old ideas and then coagulating new ones, is is the art. But you can't you see what I'm talking against a lot. Uh, to Ryan is a, 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 what I feel is a latent tendency for for Ryan to go to this place. Which is you can coagulate it and make a correct formula this way and you'd say mm, yes and no. Um, you you don't, you don't want to go too woo woo, <laughs> and you don't want to go too too rational. Uh, I think so, yeah, um, to clarify, I, I I don't think that uh, I have a different meaning for woo woo than just having um, you know. Uh, uh, I guess uh, kind of a trippy imagination. Like that's not that's not what I'm. Uh, I would say. I think uh, often there has to be some kind of uh, immune system in the meme that that keeps it alive. Kind of like the um, you know, it's a self propagating system in the Uncle Ted sense. So um, it, different, uh, and you could include scientism in that um, as a self propagating system. Uh, where you are essentially um, like if you there's like a set of talking points to why why is the establishment not accepting this and why is the like there's a there's a whole um, you know uh, set of of ideas around how to prevent um, uh, the idea's own death so that's that's different than just having an imagination. Like there's no there's no immune system in trying to imagine what a uh, riding a beam of light would be like, right? There's there's nothing there's no system involved there that's trying to self propagate. So um, I think where since we are hosts for mimetic um, uh, spread, that's where we need to have our own, um, you know. Uh, awareness about you know we're, we're essentially an amalgamation of memes that that drive our behavior we're not we're not independent of them we're not we don't have our autonomy or 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 free will like we're just like whatever we encounter and we kind of mix together like there's a chance happening that these different ideas will, will um will form some unique individuality about us but it's there's nothing like inherently um self-determination wise in that. So I, I, I'm just, I, I wanted to differentiate between Wu and um, just yeah. having objective experience. I'm just wondering whether a better way to look at the whole thing is that instead of getting in, uh, in, in, you know, getting in a situation where people feel as though they've got to pick a side, uh, is to stop being totally invested in either of them the rational scientific or the 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 uh you know more subjective realm is that you know both of these realms have got uh, it, it's like your toolbox for functioning is that you pick the appropriate tool you, you don't get invested in it uh you you don't mistake it for your to your 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 total uh capacity to function and so you know you you use rationality where that's appropriate you use science you 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 don't just dismiss uh, uh sorry i don't mean particularly you ryan using the word you um uh 
you, you know, you don't dismiss the subjective experience uh, as well. Um, but uh, it's kind of like using these things of our being there, letting them use you, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, I guess... Is... Go on. Yeah, this, the, yeah, I think both of you are absolutely right. So the what my plan is to what Ryan was saying was to ground our means and make sure that we we know what our means are because I you know the, what normally makes things pretty fluid is people misunderstand what other people's means are and then you're off to the races in an understanding you just don't have. So I think that's what the manifesto is for it's a manifesto is to establish what means we depart on so those are axioms so we can actually put them under the microscope and examine them and i think that's what we should do in in we should nothing should come out of the manifesto that is doesn't pass the test of realism or empiricism there shouldn't be anything yeah, that's, that's, what I, that's what i wanted to to you know i was a little bit worried about because um you know, just just from a a psychological standpoint, uh, you all are people that uh, understand what I'm going through right now, right? And if at the end of the manifesto I'm excluded from that, um, where I feel like I can't be a part of it anymore, like that would be no, that would be a oh, that would be a failure. Yeah, you see, you see it's 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 not uh, woo woo. We're trying to do woo way. So so there's. We, we have enough, um, you know, um, divergent agreement in, in this and in, in all the participants to make a very nice heterogeneous group. So it, we, would, we would fail if we, you know, wind up excluding one, uh, one person out of the, the irregard would be kind of like a net loss for, for the, the manifesto and the project itself. So it, it, it only works if we can get everybody in, involved, prepared, involved um, and to make sure that they can all sign off on it. Otherwise, it's not, it's uh, already partial and on a, a bad footing. So, so an important task for you, Ryan, is to keep on see, keeping us on that path and making sure that we, we don't go off the rails in that direction. Um, but you know, if if we came up with something and then you said like, ah, no, Ryan doesn't sign off on that, I think then we should go back to the drawing board and start over <laughs> until we can actually get something that that everybody's satisfied with. Because for one thing, it won't travel very far. If, if we we are heterogeneous enough in 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 this group that if it doesn't fly with us, it's not going to fly anywhere. It, so I mean, in general, they're like. There's a theory that there are about 20 personality types and stuff. We've got enough people already to, to actually, you know, cover the board in terms of um, you know, making making sure that we're not partial or partisan or to this or to that. Yeah, I, I think um, one way where I could, uh, I, I've been just kind of turning it over in my head as for, you know, how to, um, I guess, uh, turn coat against rationality in a way, um, is from Ishmael, the, the book with the, the levers and the takers and, and, and the idea that, you know, the, the rationality essentially is, and sci the scientific method and stuff is, is, a, is a proxy for power that gets usurped by psychopaths for um, the techno-industrial system. So it's essentially, yes, it is, it does get you truth, but uh, would you rather be in an innocuous, uh, you know, hunter gatherer that is uh, able to continue to survive or go extinct? Like those are your options. And um, I'd like to, if there's a way, to um, have the um, have my cake and eat it too, where where I can still be, uh, where I can not accept like some of the the spiritual beliefs of animism or something like this um, it, it, uh, wholesale while still being a truth seeker and not causing damage to the earth. So I, I saw um, Dune the, yesterday and all the Fremen technology 
is technology which is interfacing with nature. It is making sure that it's 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 not trying to conquer nature. It's trying to to live within it in harmony, and they don't need anything but that. Right? And I'm I'm trying to think if if there's a way that we can have enough truth to be able to achieve that kind of a goal, um, without becoming the psychopathic um, techno industrial system. Yeah. So ir irrational energy is also co-opted by psychopaths, so for power. So both rationality and irrationality are, are, are co co-opted for power. But um, I think the the thing to do is um, is in in Shakespeare. It's kind of um, it's the Merchant of Venice, unfortunately. But the is to be a lawyer about it. You see, the the devil is in the detail. So the way the way to get it is to not take too much of an ab absolute stand. So what I mean is by this is uh, it's very it's very easy to to lay down a principle or lay down the law, and you'd say, well, you mustn't lay down the law. Well, no, that's not quite true either. The thing is to to do is say you can have your cake and eat it. That 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 is what how it must be way. Because you you want to be able to say yes for now. <laughs> so in other words, you you never closed off to religion or rationalism. You can do religion one minute and be completely woo, -woo and that's okay, and be rational the next minute. So, so I, yeah, I, I think that's say that people don't give themselves enough leeway. Like with religion, I, I mm. keep on trying to say that, that you you can go to church, you can go to church and pray, you can get all the benefits. But you see, if you pick over. And be very rational about what are the benefits. Does any benefit come from the pulpit? No. Fuck all comes from the pulpit. In fact, there's just a steady stream of harm. They're just doing all the smells and bells and nice satwa and stuff to get you in there so that they can give you their propaganda. So fuck the guy on the pulpit. As long as you know that he's talking shit and never be prepared to say it to him too. It's like, you are full of shit, Monsignor. And then basically, he knows he's full of shit. And he, you know, you'll see an exorcist leap out of his mouth as soon as you expose him. But doesn't mean you can't go to church and get the smells and bells and the satwa and all the peace and all the communion with a God that doesn't exist. It's like, have it all. Just take that and then basically leave the rest. It's the curate's egg. And then just, just move on. You see, everybody says, you must be like this with religion. And say, on when? Tuesday? Because I go to church on Wednesday, fucking take all the psychic energy out of the shit on their church and go. So am I a Christian? Yeah, I'm a church going Christian. But you're a fucking devil. Yeah, I'm a devil too. So you can't have it always if you pick and choose very carefully. So be, be yeah, very that goes back to, to, to what I was. I, mean, I think that was what I was trying to hatch, talking about, you know, um, uh, you know, using the thing, not letting it use you and, and remaining, um, you know, don't get overly invested in, in the church or whatever the opposite is to the church. You, you it's like go the, there. It's very important. It's like the Buddha tale uh, of, the, of, the, of the boat to cross the river and you leave it once you've crossed the you river. You leave it behind, you yeah. You yeah. yourself carrying the boat afterwards, you know. Mm. Yeah, you, you don't want to be a complete prick like Thomas Beckett or any one of these guys like Faulty is doing this. He's going to get nailed to a cross. So basically you say like, you know, what's the correct ideology? Is this the correct ideology? Well, it depends. If you fucking nail me to the cross and say, you know, is Jesus the true Christ? I say, yes, he fucking is. <laughs> now let me off the cross. And I'll mean it in that moment. Two seconds later, hmm. Something change different. your mind again. Yeah, yeah you, you're allowed to change your mind. You know, every, see, a lot of ways is people are, are bad actors in the play. They, they're given this cue and they respond to yesterday's yesterday's line. So well, the other thing is too, there's, you could say there might be something for taking a scientific look at the unscientific things and taking a... Um, an unscientific look at the scientific things and, and getting a, a richer uh, perspective by, by doing that instead of, um, you know, keeping this sort of rigid segregation and, 
Yeah. In, in well, one way we might be able to do that is to uh, recognize we're using a false dichotomy there, where um, there it's not just you know once you fall off the scientific rationalist wagon that that you fall into a an unscientific wagon, like or a, a um, you know a woo wagon <laughs> or whatever. Like there's there's plenty of room for other kinds of experiences in there, and we shouldn't just see it as a binary. Uh, in fact, um, going back to Hugh, your your fractal um, uh, in yang uh, symbol. I, I think for the manifesto or whatnot, um, I, I'm starting to feel like we need to incorporate um, some of the mathematical wisdom that we've found in like the Newton's fractal and these kinds of things where to have your cake and eat it too, you can't have an absolute. You can't say be this way or be that way. We're going to have to include some some fractal rules in our <laughs> manifesto that that allows you to you know don't follow the rules but follow these rules <laughs> and and have and have the solution to that be a fractal instead of um, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so so the way I'm writing the manifesto is there are no rules. So, so basically what I'm saying is we have the desiderata extinctionati. So the desiderata are not rules, they're just desirables. So this is so so the most the that I would suggest the manifesto says is that it points to, you know, say, well, given this ideology or this you know, belief system or whatever you want to call it, then then uh, how do you behave? And you say, well, we think you should behave according to the desiderata if you want. <laughs> but written, this that contradiction and fractal nature is written into the desiderata. If you go into them, you'll see they are contradictory. And so, but we're well aware of that and deliberately, it's almost like a joke. So a lot, a lot of this is it's a joke in the end. Um, but Alan Watts, <laughs> but we haven't we haven't left alternate reality game. By the way, we're just moving it along. I was just thinking that that uh, Alan Watts spoke a few times about the the need for the the opposite or the antithesis to anything that that you wouldn't know what it was or what you had or what you were doing unless it had had, a, had an obverse side to it um you know would you know you were being rational unless you were able to entertain the irrational and had some kind of a feeling for what that is um it, it, you know and a little bit like these rules or des desirable things that the de desiderata um being contradictory in a way uh is you know without that contradiction you'd be less aware of what you had um, it, 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 everything it, it's like you 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 uh, can do a drawing on a page and keep drawing and drawing and drawing and eventually your drawing will disappear because you've completely covered the page in ink um, you, you actually depended upon having the opposite to the drawing being there in other words the blank page or the paper um, you need negative space you know, yeah. yeah you need yeah yeah. There's a danger in casting things in stone, um, but if you cast something in stone, then it has to be Delphic. So it has to be at the risk of being impenetrable and ignored. Uh, it has to be Delphic. So, so you you if you play the game of of writing and putting things in writing, that's totalitarian, fundamentally totalitarian, and its its aim is to it's propaganda to the reader, and it's try, trying to control their thought and their mind and ultimately their behavior. There's no other writing that's been done that hasn't had that aim in mind. So you're playing the alien cortex's game. You're in enemy territory just by writing, putting things in, writing them in stone. The freak art is that they're Delphic and they in the legalistic way is you still have an escape route out of the logic in that you that you committed to a totalitarian form if that makes any sense <laughs> would you explain what delphic means in this context it means that it's cryptic so it was i would say it's it's what i'd call crypto random so in other words something that looks random 
but uh, it's it's not dualistic in in terms of a false dichotomy or some kind of dichotomy. It's not dichotomous. It it it, it appears to be dichotomous to people with the dichotomous brain, but it, in essence, it's a mirror. It just reflects what you interrogated with. So if you come with a dichotomous mindset, you will get a dichotomous conclusion out of it, and and then you'll be wrong because. Pythia will tell you something that will get you defeated at the river sticks. But the, and then you'll realize, damn, she's a bitch. But she's not really a bitch. She just laid it out in in a thing that has more than one meaning. So that it's nuanced enough that that uh, it's not Pythia talking to you, it's you talking to you. So if you get close enough to the truth, you, you just put down stuff that in essence, is, is so contradictory, it's neutral. and But that's not random. Now, most people would say, okay, you've just put down random junk. No, it's not random junk. That's the key. See, if people look at Jackson Pollock and stuff and they say, ah, oh, he's just putting down random junk. I can do that. Go try. <laughs> You'll soon find out that he wasn't putting down random junk. So they say, what was he doing? Say, well, the best way to describe that says, like, it's crypto random. It has structure and meaning. There's form in there. But it's it's again it's kind of this fractal infinite form that just just won't go in a box. In fact, Jackson Pollock was doing exactly that. He was putting fractal stuff. He did a lot of that stuff drunk, a lot of that art drunk. So the reason why is because he had to get in the fine balance between control and and uh, just just random. But no, he. Jackson Pollock was a real artist because he put down on canvas um, crypto random stuff. Yeah. In essence, it always winds up being a mirror. <laughs> well, okay, should we? Yeah, go ahead. Can we go now, sir? Yes, yeah. yes. I, I was going to say this is like, wow, uh, shit, that's a long one. Um, I'm sorry it went on so long. I just couldn't find a place to stop. You can't stop with this kind of shit. Yeah. No Kronos here. No Kronos here at all. Yeah, <laughs> well, we, we, we fucking kicked Kronos in the nuts this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, it, there's, there's one thing. Uh, earlier we talked about the social dilemma. Is that right? Um, I just wanted to provide some, some context around that. Um, so the, the suggestions in the social dilemma were that we should tax data and stuff to, to make it so that... Um, that uh, it would be bad and what that would, um, so, but the, the consequence of doing that would be uh, that only Google and Facebook would be able to afford those taxes. It would be essentially like the supporting the system in itself. So the, um, the same reason why the, the Sherman antitrust amendments and things like that were uh, lobbied by Standard Oil and, and uh, uh, th those companies, because they, they, they became more profitable after. So uh, don't believe the propaganda in the social dilemma. The problems are real. The solutions are wrong. Um, it's similar to the, uh, you know, cap and trade or something like that. Like, it, it's, it's designed as a solution that, that, that reinforces the problem. Um, and Ryan, you're absolutely right. And I think it goes for a lot of those very talented dogs documentaries on various issues, whether it's climate, politics, um, social dilemma is there. It, it's well done, the conclusions, just forget about them. Yeah, uh, check, check the Hated Ones video on the social dilemma, it's, it's, uh, it's good. Yeah, I was going to say, it's just like the carbon tax. Is, is like, yeah. Yep. Uh, but, but anyway, yeah, it is a bit of a quagmire to get too deep into that. And I, should, I say, like, we should just cut right across the whole, the whole argument, the whole macho, the whole, the whole dialogue. Just cut clean across it with the flipping and just say, like, nah, clocks run out. Don't worry about the carbon tax. Why? Not enough time. <laughs> I mean, you know, fuck people over that way. Yeah. All right. Well, let's. Uh, you, you you can you can go on splitting hairs and arguing with these guys in, forever. That's that's a win for the alien cortex. That's what the alien cortex wants you to do. It's trying to get you in the brambles. So okay, so there's a quick way of getting out of the brambles, and that's just to force still. <laughs>
So whenever you feel yourself in the brambles, the way to step back is to just go straight to your senses. The brambles are in your left brain. So it's just the quickest way you can get out of your left brain is to get into your senses. Everything is connected to the world in your senses. So it just sucks the energy out of your left brain and leaves you in reality. So let's just do it. And you can do that at any time. Just, just get get used to it. But I got to get back in the real world now because uh, the storms are coming in for days and days. It's literally Kairos and stuff. So I've got to like set the lines, and but I don't think I'll be able to go ashore for, long, for days now. There's very big storms and winds coming in, so I'm, I'm not going to be able to. We're the same here. We've no. had four, seven, eight. And it's it is yeah, blown like it's the season, it's, yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. And they they all they all suddenly, guys. This is all climate change. This is not supposed to be happening. And it's uh, it's probably because Europe is warming up. It's it's you know the, it's coming from the Sahara, which is a hot place, and and it's it's supposed to be blowing you know northwest to southerlies now, but you know to northerlies winds, but. In, in winter now, but it's it's blowing southerly, and it's, I guess it's because um, you know the jet stream has moved and the Europe has got warmer, and it's you know. Anyway, it's happening. <laughs> it's happening way faster than the dialogue. <laughs> so, so the real world is moving fast yeah. now. It does seem to. All be. right. Okay. Thanks, well, here. Thanks, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Okay.